Hello and welcome everyone to the political philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, with this stream, I hope we can achieve two things. First, ascertain some sort of outline, potentially a comprehensive outline of Tolkien's political outlook, though I'm sure we will be gleaming this mostly from the thematic elements contained in The Lord of the Rings and the Tolkien legendarium in total. Secondly, I hope the stream can act as some form of summation and satisfying conclusion uh, to what has been arranged today as Tolkien Day, where myself and many content creators have celebrated Tolkien's 130th anniversary by producing Tolkien-related videos across many channels. Um, regarding the various subtopics of Tolkien's political outlook, I think it will be constructive to focus on. Uh, there are a few particular themes. So first of all, we have the broad conception and nature of power, uh, which Nathan Hood here has elucidated wonderfully in a previous video. So we'll only have to briefly cover this topic, I'm sure. Uh, religion in general, Christianity in particular, although Lambda has, with his previous stream, also focused on Christianity. So this will mainly be on the political aspects informing Christianity and Catholicism in particular. Monarchy, in particular, sacred monarchy and restorationism. Anarchism, and in particular, medieval anarchism versus centralization, just to um, bring up one of my favorite um, Tolkien quotes. The most improper job of any man is bossing other men. Not one in a million is fit for it, least of all those who seek the opportunity. Here we have the idea of nationhood, hierarchy, lineage, and race in Tolkien. The politics of industrialization versus conservationism. And finally, Tolkien's philosophy on war. Now, I am very lucky to be joined by three contributors to Tolkien Day. Radical Liberation, who has offered us some invaluable insights into Tolkien's relationship with the academic establishment and the work of Tom Shippey. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Pleasure. Mr. Patriarch, who has produced a wonderful video on the Christian parallels with Genesis and the music of the Ainur. Thanks. Uh, very glad you enjoyed it and very happy to be here. I am. And a late edition, but I only think a just edition, my my fellow co-collaborator, um, who deserves all of the praise and some of the blame, no doubt, for um, for Talking Day, who has produced um, both a stream and a video on um, the nature of power, both with regards to the ring and power in general and the scouring of the Shire. Hello, Nathan Hood. Hello, AM. I think you get half the blame too. Um, but yeah, delighted <laughs> to be here. And I'm sitting here with a bottle of Hobgoblin to, to celebrate. So looking forward to it. Nice. <laughs> and of course, we are joined by the most distinguished Catholic and uh, monarchist uh, historian and talking scholar, uh, Charles Coulomb, who has written two wonderful articles on this topic, which I have included in the description. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, A Catholic View and Kingship in the Work of the Inklings. Hello. Hello, thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. So AM, may I just briefly praise Tolkien Day before we launch into it, since it's the end of the it's the end, it's the final part of the day. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, uh, in, in one of our private chats, someone was talking about, and and if any of us who've been around Tolkien stuff know know the type, he was talking about the sort of person who um, they've read all this stuff and they're like deep into the details and like elven genealogies and all this stuff, but they've read nothing else. Right. <laughs> and so that can be kind of annoying. Right. Um, one of the patterns I noticed in Tolkien day is that none of the participants were coming from that place at all. Uh, what we got today was rich context brought to help us see Tolkien in new ways. That certainly was the impact on me. I mentioned that, for example, um, the emphasis of the discussion uh, with Mr. D on his visual work, his visual art, Tolkien's visual art, as well as Panama hats on poetry, for example, uh, has me wanting to go back and look at everything a second time, you know, <laughs> or, well, a second time, another time, <laughs> um, and, and with new eyes and looking, looking with more appreciation for some of these other things where I, I just had focused on Tolkien as a prose, a writer of prose. Anyway, my point is, I, I just, I'm, I'm, it's exceeded my expectations, Nathan and I am. Uh, we got, uh, I think, a really rich tapestry of insight and context for, even for somebody who thinks he really knows Tolkien, I feel like I need to start over again or something after today. So wonderful work, everyone. 
Well, thank you very much for that radical liberation. And I think um, uh, perhaps a good way to start is perhaps getting some introductory thoughts, some general thoughts on um, uh, what people would summarise as the essential nature of um, Tolkien's political philosophy. Uh, Charles, if it's all right, can I start with you? Uh, certainly. I would say that uh, Tolkien has to be understood as one who was in a certain sense anti-political in the sense that we think of politics. Uh, which is, after all, a quest for the first place of the public trough. Um, he, his views, if you look at them in terms of modern politics, they're hard to make any sense out of, because on the one hand, he's in favor of monarchy, he's in favor of structure, he's in favor of all this, but he's also against power. And as he put it himself, and, well, he put it himself that if you were to ask him what he was, he would say he was either an anarchist or a non-constitutional, unconstitutional monarchist. The reason why he could say that, uh, and the reason why it seemed like an organic hole to him, was that uh, in his mind, I think, was very much an image of what was the medieval polis, the medieval state, which from our point of view isn't much of a state at all. Uh, he was... Uh, not the only one who thought that way uh, in his time. Uh, Chesterton and Bellick with their distributism, uh, Penty and Guild Socialism, a lot of other movements and other groups throughout Europe, actually, uh, and not just in his period, but reaching back to people like the Jacobites, the Carlists, and so on, all had a roughly similar vision, uh, which you could sum up really in four, four words alter, throne, subsidiarity, and solidarity. Uh, and if you look at the Shire, you look at uh, the relationship afterwards, the reestablished empire to the Shire, the Shire. And if you know your medieval political theory and these other people, he's very clearly part, on the one hand, of a tradition uh, that goes back a long time and has had exponents, a lot of exponents in his day. Uh, when both World War I and the Depression uh, caused people to question the whole political project since the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, which we're still feeding on today. Uh, our standard uh, manner of politics owes a lot to the ideas of the Enlightenment and the revolutions and so forth. Uh, and that he was all very much, uh, very much against, not because he was in favor of despotism, quite the contrary. He saw these things as bringing in despotism under the guise of freedom. He, he made, I'll just say one thing, which perhaps I should reserve to later. It's a quote from him in one of his letters. Uh, he says, doffing the cap to the squire may not do him any good, but it's awfully good for you. Wonderful. Um, moving on to, I mean, Radlib, uh, this is of particular interest because you have recently undergone a metamorphosis of, of, a, of a kind from um, a libertarian anarchist to a medieval anarchist. And so I wonder well, in, the, in the context of It's just of a change of label, but I, I thought Charles <laughs> might like my new uh, label, medieval yeah. anarchist. Yeah, I thought you're being in a position to appreciate it. Yeah, I can't fight it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I don't know that I really changed, but I just thought that that label might be less confusing for some of my uh, some of my friends in our circles. Um, also, Charles, I should mention that I uh, had the great pleasure of meeting Eric von Conolt Ladin right near the end of his life, yeah. and uh, you know, I got he, he I got to you know as a young man be humiliated in a room full of eminent people as I did a weak defense of democracy and he absolutely shot me down. Anyway, great, great, great memory. Um, yeah, so Tolkien, here's a theme that springs to mind when you ask this question, power versus authority. Okay, so what do we mean by power? Power can mean a lot of different things. People say, I have the power to lift this barbell, right? It can mean a lot of things. What is, what, what is Tolkien talking about when he talks about power as a problem, you know? Uh, when, when he uses the ring as a symbol of power, what, what do we mean by that? Can we can we identify this kind of power? Well, I think we can, and here's how. Um, uh, um, power 
in this sense, in Tolkien's sense, in the negative sense of the term here, undermines proper authority, the authority of father, priest, community, right? If it was a positive power, it would support natural authorities. But the kind of power that we experience regularly, I, I, it's fair to say, uh, is always undermining these things. And so I think that's its trademark, uh, that it's going to undermine the family and so forth, right? Um, fortunately, Nathan Hood uh, stole my thunder because uh, before I even saw that he was doing this, I was thinking we've got to bring up the scouring of the Shire in this discussion. Um, because it seems to me that this is the place where you get maybe the closest to a sort of a fleshed out politics from Tolkien, that little section there in the Lord of the Rings. It's not so little actually, but um, it, it's, a just, it's a political dystopia along the lines of a 1984, right? Or a brave new world. It's, it's Tolkien's political dystopia. And it's so revealing as Nathan's, Nathan's developed. And, and I, I think you guys brought this out, right? But um, you see that undermining of all of the things that are natural to the hobbits um, is undermined by this, I don't know what you want to call it, progressive socialist regime or something. I, <laughs> I was going to say progress, yes. <laughs> yeah, pro progress, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you see the undermining of all of, the, all of these things. And, and so uh, I think Tolkien, this, this power versus authority theme that I was just bringing up, mentioning, I think the scouring of the Shire puts meat on those bones, right? You read the scouring of the Shire and you see exactly what he means by uh, a power that's destructive. And you see exactly the relationship of that power to traditional community relationships, et cetera, et cetera, right? Wonderful. And I think that's um, a wonderful segue. Um, Nathan, is there any uh, broad overarching point you want to um uh, to provide before we go into the nitty gritty. Just to build on what Charles and Radlip have already kind of commented on, it's a um, power in this sense, it's a subversion of the natural order. And throughout uh, Tolkien's work, you see this uh, manifest in the environment. It's visibly seen. So Mordor is a desert and nothing lives there except on the borders. In the, shire, in the scouring of the Shire, trees are cut down, houses are burnt, gardens are filled with weeds. And we also see it in creatures too. So Gollum, who starts out as a rather looking, a normal looking hobbit, ends up this mangled, monstrous form. Orcs are twisted elves in origin. Uh, and over time, they become, look physically monstrous. So this idea of the natural order being so essential is it's manifest in kind of what we would understand as nature too. Wonderful. And um, without further ado, we'll get on to Mr. Patriarch. Hello. Hi. <laughs> no, I guess all I have to say, um, <clears throat> just sort of very broad strokes, I'll just sort of go with my very broad impressions, which I think are have already been elucidated by uh, the likes of Charles and Radlib here. But um, yes, there's a clear, on the one hand, a... Uh, a reverence and acceptance of sort of authority of kingship, you know, the return of the king, return to order um, as, as sort of a way to sort of revitalize the, the nations of men, Gondor specifically. Um, yet on the other hand, there's great respect for particularity. Um, so the Shire has their sort of system of doing things. Uh, the Dunedain in the north um, sort of exists in the wilderness and then the, you know, uh, Aragon sort of reestablishes the King of Arnor, sort of again bringing a restoration to the north. It's not a revolution, it's a restoration. And that's sort of, I think, sort of the key idea. And also likewise with Theoden and whatnot, um, the, they're, they're sort of allied to Gondor, but again, there's no uh, drive to sort of impose a order on them, which is sort of foreign to them as a people. And as we see with the Shire, there's a, a much more sort of um, decentralized <laughs> political order, if you want to call it that, where there's the mayor who doesn't really have, you know, much you know, power or, 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 you know, doesn't really, ex I mean, he has some authority, but the, uh, the living situation of the hobbits is much more, you could say, idyllic and kind of um, what, what you might hope for and 
a more uh, civilized world, <laughs> for lack of a better term, and also a general um, uh, revulsion in Tolkien for progress for its own sake. So Saruman is sort of held up as the on the on the one hand as kind of the the forces of industry, and sort of what he ends up bringing to the Shire is seen as it's sort of a tragedy. So you have on the one hand, raw power being exerted on the Shire, which is definitely frowned upon from the uh, perspective of the author and in the text and the people who live there. Um, and also not only that, but an upending of their way of life for the purposes of, you know, you could say industrialization, but uh, I guess I'll leave it there. Yeah, so I'll just um, summarize this point. Obviously, I've got a, um, a version of um, Sauron from the Peter Jackson adaptation. And just to summarize on this point, I mean, obviously, broad strokes conception of power. Um, to me, all idea of legitimacy comes from the creator, it comes from Eru Iluvatar. And right at the beginning of the conception of that world in the music of, Aino, of the Ainur, you have the element of discord, which is brought in by Melkor, the idea, this initial idea of a usurpation. And this idea of a usurpation of subverting the natural order of an organic political organism is obviously the recurring theme, which you know all of you have um, elucidated to some extent. And this is you know, personified in Melkor, Morgoth, Sauron, uh, Kuromo, uh, Saruman, and you know, reaches its culmination, I think most explicitly, as you mentioned, Radlib, in the scouring of the Shire. And I think with that broad conception, this idea of legitimate authority and a usurpation of a natural authority, this idea of a sort of harmonious political nature and a subversion or a corruption of that nature, um, we'll get into the specifics, uh, which is the broad implications of um, political Christianity and political Catholicism uh, woven into the themes, not just of Tolkien's legendarium, but of um, Tolkien's own mindset. Does anyone want to um, start well, us off on this topic? Since I'm not a Catholic, I feel like I, I, I should jump in um, and uh, give an appreciation as a non-Catholic, um, but a, a Christian. Um, so yeah, as we mentioned at the beginning, I, I, I call myself a medieval anarchist now, and I've sort of been thinking about using that term for some time. Charles, I was waiting for apostolic majesty to confirm to me that I had the right idea about the Middle Ages and wasn't getting my history <laughs> wrong, you know, um, because, you know, the, the picture in my mind is of a greatly, well, relative to today, for sure, a, a more decentralized order, right? Um, more of a patchwork quilt as opposed to... Um, you know, well, turning everything into a department or whatever, <laughs> uh, which is what we get these days. A anyway, so <clears throat> one of the first lectures I heard at the Mises Institute was from Ralph Rako, dear departed friend Ralph Rako. He talked about, you know, what happened in Europe? How did Europe have this sort of the, the European miracle? How did it have such amazing developments in economics and so forth? And he said, uh, it's because the Roman Empire was never reformed. And he talked about how there were contending authorities in Europe. There was the church, right? Uh, but the church, um, if, if you're a, your picture of the Middle Ages is that like the church was just absolutely dominant over everything in Europe and sort of ruled it as an empire, that would be just utterly wrong as I understand it. No. The church was certainly a significant player in, in, in medieval Europe, right? But it was contending with dukes and and, and little bishoprics, and you know, uh, it, it was uh, um, any one person probably was experiencing overlapping authorities in their life, you know, Precisely. right? They, there wasn't just like the one the, the one unitary state that affected everything in their life. It, to some in some areas, they were sort of um, dealing with the authority of the church. In other areas, they were dealing with the authority of the local lord. In other areas, with a king or something, you know. And and none of these were exactly a simple hierarchy. This is why, right, the pyramid picture of the of um, the medieval era is not very good, right? Where it just shows like the king at the top and everybody, you know, this pyramid, you know, just these clear lines of power. I I I, I gather that that's a really bad way. Uh to depict it's, it. Charles, please. It, it, it is. I mean, it has a certain utility only in the sense of giving a kind of framework 
But, you know, you started on something which is very key to understanding the medieval setup, and that is the distinction between power and authority. Now, to put it another way, authority is the right to say what ought to happen, what ought to be done. Power is the ability to make it happen. So your doctor has the authority to prescribe a medicine for you, but only you have the power to actually take it. Now, in the medieval setup, uh, it's, again, you've got to remember, too, that Platonism, consciously or otherwise, was a big part of the mental construct. And, I, and I'll explain why in a sec. So, theoretically, anyway, uh, authority came from God. It was mediated by the church uh, via the coronation rite and so forth. Uh, the emperor was the top, the Holy Roman Emperor was the, the top uh, monarch in a sense. But again, you, we have to put out of our mind the, the modern view of these things. I guess a good way to, to, to make it easy is that we're sort of the reverse. With them, with the medievals, authority was concentrated in the church, in the emperor, in the kings. But power was extremely diffuse because everybody had some. The church had some. The king had some. The, the nobility had some. The cities had some. The guilds had some. Even the serfs had some. If nothing else, they were the people who made sure everyone ate. And that was a quiet power all its own. They also couldn't be thrown off the land. And that, too, was a power. So, the uh, mind you, sometimes they uh, didn't care for that kind of power, but you know, things, things are like that. So, with us, it's just the opposite. With us, power is concentrated in a very few very small areas, and authority is very diffuse, nominally through the ballot box. So because, it, because the source of authority is not clearly identifiable, there's no one who actually exercises it, per se. It, it becomes a very odd thing. And then again, with the, in the medieval setup, the reason for authority was clear. It was not an end in itself. It was basically a way of performing the will of God. Obedience to the sovereign was obedience to God if, God, if the sovereign was obeying God. And law, unlike with us, which is something that we create you know, as we, as we go along, for the medievals, law was something pre-existing. And justice occurred when human law was in accord with divine law. There's one other concept that has to be brought in, I think, and that's the idea, and again, it's illustrative, of the king's peace. Now, remember that the king had very little power, really, and he certainly didn't have a governmental structure, no secret police, no income tax, etc. But let's pretend for a minute that uh, there was a fellow playing the robber on the king's highway running through our town. The local lord or the sheriff or whomever would call out the you and cry, and we'd go out and uh, uh, grab the bad guy, <laughs> give him a fair trial, and then execute him, and the king's peace was restored. But what did the king have to do with that? Well, not a lot, because the king, a good king was like an orchestra leader, and he balanced things off against the other. A bad king... He might make things un unpleasant for the people immediately around him, but he wasn't, the result wasn't despotism, it was anarchy. And that, that was the result of bad kings. If you had a, um, if you had a lord or a city or something that uh, disagreed radically with the king and the king wanted to punish them, really, the only thing you could do was declare them outlawed or in the empire, put them under the ban of the empire, which meant that any of their neighbors could march in and, and deal with them uh, with royal authority. But he had very little means. It, this, this was the weakness of the medieval state. That's why in time it, it slowly it morphed into the centralized states we know, we know about. But while it lasted for quite a number of centuries, it, it worked fairly well. Um, <clears throat> Only other thing I wanted to just drop, uh, hopefully as a foreshadowing for another day we'll have someday. Um, there's a book by C.S. Lewis called The Discarded Image, An Introduction to Medieval and Renaissance Literature. And I have not studied it, 
But my understanding is it is a good helper for getting into the mindset that Charles is talking about, which feels so far away from what we, our own experience now, that you have to make an effort um, to, to get your head back into that place, I think. No. Um, and I remember one scholar, by the way, just quick story, a, a scholar was talking to me, um, not a Christian, I don't think, and he had read the discarded image and he was sort of shocked by it. He said, he said, it's like Lewis thinks maybe the medievals, like we should maybe see things the way they saw them. <laughs> yes. Well, it's a thought. <laughs> It it does uh, it is it is a truth that uh, certainly just as uh, we tolerate things that they would never have tolerated uh, they tolerated things that we would never tolerate. Um, I mean, you could make the argument that one reason why plagues and, so, and that sort of thing went through Europe so terribly at different times was because there was no one to order social distancing and lock them in their houses. You could make that argument. But the plagues came and the plagues went, as they tend to do. Um, it is a very, very different mindset, but it's one that I think that Tolkien, for a number of reasons, not just one, understood very well. And I think, I think he understood very well, partly because of his being fostered at the oratory, and uh, because of Father Morgan, who played a, a big role in his in his uh, uh, growth, and also being so familiar with the literatures of the different nations of Europe in the Middle Ages, he could see at once the connections and similarities between them and the many differences you spoke of earlier. Because that's the other thing. Know that you, you rightly alluded to. It was a patchwork quilt of all sorts of things. And you, you had fiefs that were uh, under not just the king of France or the emperor, but both. Exactly. Right. And, Over, and, overlapping um, jurisdictions, you could say. Precisely. Right. So, so yeah, where's yeah. the border there? Well, it's here and it's there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, one of the, the key points of the scouring of the Shire, where he touches on this and on the idea of traditional authority, is, of course, the reaction of the Thane and the Tooks. Because, of course, in the, uh, the pre-Sharky pre uh, phase of the, uh, of the Shire, the Thane was, as so to speak, viceroy of the absent king. The Thane was the center of authority. And if anyone was going to do anything, which by itself is another question, but if anybody was, it would be the Thane and none other. The mayor of Mickle Delving is an interesting character as well because he's very much like what European and particularly English mayors were like in the Middle Ages. And even now, you know, in most towns in England, they're only elected for a year and they're completely ceremonial figures. They don't really have that much more power than their medieval forebears did. What's changed is that urban government has so much more power. But they only nominally preside over it. It's almost as if um, these forms of government represent pimple in all of these narratives. But anyway, um, I think just some broad points regarding, you know, religion and uh, political Catholicism before we move on to talk more about kingship, even though um, Charles has wonderfully brought up certain aspects of it. Um, just a few things to throw out there and um, anyone can just respond to this. Um, general thoughts. First of all, I have an image here of the of the Astari, of the of the five wizards. Uh, of course, the two blue wizards, Radagast, Gandalf, and Saruman. Um, one interesting aspect about Tolkien is the fact that there is no established religion, there is no established church, there is there are no formal clerics, and yet the Astari are perhaps the closest thing we have to a clerical cl cast within Lord of the Rings. Um, to my mind, they are very reminiscent, I, I believe I've mentioned this in the previous stream, of the Christian Pentarchy, uh, the five highest ranking bishops within the United Christian Church. And of course, the head of the Astari is effectively the de facto Pope. 
Um, among other elements of this is something recurring in Tolkien, which is the conflict between temporal power and, as you mentioned, um, Charles, this idea of authority, or in this case, this would be the spiritual domain, the domain of law, the domain of truth, the domain of absolutes versus the execution of that power. And um, of course, one particular aspect of the Valar, the, the Ainur, obviously Melkor rebels against Eru Iluvatar, and you know, Saruman does so also, and um, and Sauron, of course. And so we have um, these you know, angelic creatures who were intended essentially to act as these um, uh, spiritual guides, these these aspects almost of um, the authority of um, the one Eru Iluvatar uh, within the world of Lord of the Rings. Nevertheless, with Saruman in particular, just to, um, to bring up Saruman, this idea of um, temporal power and authority and wanting to wield temporal power as a means of imposing some sort of vision on the world um, is a very strong motif running throughout Lord of the Rings. And of course, Gandalf represents the, the antithesis of that. I mean, Gandalf does have his own um, conflict with uh, political authority. This is best exhibited. I mean, Nathan, you brought this up in your wonderful video uh, with his conflict uh, with the steward of Gondor, Denethor and how Gandalf essentially has to provide that strength for the Gondorians within the Siege of Minas Tirith, whilst Denethor has essentially, he's abandoned the rightful authority of Aragorn, later King Elisar, and the idea that there should be a king in Gondor. Um, he is thinking of his own dynasty, and he's thinking about his own authority within the city, which is now an illegitimate authority. And Gandalf, in many ways, instigates that return to some form of um, restoration. Um, all of these themes are, um, are woven into Lord of the Rings. And um, just because I have you here, Charles, um, a qu a quite a topic which is often recurring on my channel is the conflict between the Gelfs and the Ghibellines. Yeah. And I can't help but um, feel when looking at the examples provided in Lord of the Rings regarding, you know, obviously we'll, we'll talk more about restorationism uh, when we get to the, the, the part on monarchy, um, but the, the fundamental friction between religious power trying to attain temporal power and of the secular authority of kingship. So for example, we have this with the investiture controversy. Um, we have this with Henry VIII, and there are many other examples. And you know, principally, this is the central conflict that defines you know, the Holy Roman Empire, um, the attempted restoration of some form of, um, well, the restoration of a Catholic form of the Roman Empire in the West. So anyone, does, does anyone have any sort of broad comments or sort of um, uh, things they want to latch onto there? <laughs> Well, I, I did have one other thought about the role of the church in the political order of medieval Europe, and I wish I could find the paper. I'm looking on a CP and I can't find it. Anyway, uh, Catholic friend Jörg uh, Guido Holzmann, um, now in France, I think. Anyway, he um, wrote a paper about the, and I wish I could remember his argument, but basically he argued that the universality of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages uh, was a key reason that they were th 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 that decentralization was able to work. Mm -hmm. um, so what what he's arguing there, I think, is that um, there there was actually there was a sort of um, unification in Europe, right? It just wasn't the kind of unification we're used to looking for. Mm -hmm. We're used to looking for a strict political kind of you know, an EU kind of uh, European Union or something like that, right? He says, but there was a there was a unification in the sense that um, pretty much everybody was Catholic <laughs> for, for a good chunk there, right? Um, certainly in Western Europe, and um, and so that gave a sort of a foundation for there to be a Europe, right? But um, it didn't require. Uh, because it was something that was sort of uh, decentralized in its acceptance, you could say, right? Um, it didn't require political authority to like impose a morality on everyone. Um, the morality was voluntarily accepted universally. You know, at least pay, people paid lip service, if nothing else. They paid lip service to, to Christianity, to Catholicism. Um, and and uh, that was a f facilitated a decentralized political order. Anyway, if I find the paper, I will I will share it with everyone. Um, I, I might have to write them to get the title, but uh, but uh, it's an interesting argument, and I, I think it um, connects back to what we're talking about here. 
Well, I, I think that's true. The the idea of all of the states, uh, all of the uh, states of Europe forming the Respublica Christiana uh, and seeing the conflicts between them as being more in the way of the civil war, of civil wars than national wars. And of course, the church uh, tried to limit those things as much as they could, the truce of God, the peace of God, things like that. Uh, and also, for that matter, uh, the Crusades, which regardless of their outcome and regardless of their uh, uh, messing up from time to time, uh, they were the one of the very few collective efforts on the part of Europe as a whole. And the First Crusade in particular, which was called really at the request of uh, what we would call the Eastern Orthodox, um, there was their repeated appeals after Manzikert that, that brought them in. Um, but as far as the Astari, uh, you know, operating like the clergy at that time, there's a lot of truth to it. Uh, Saruman, indeed, initially functions as a kind of pope, but he's ensnared uh, beyond where he should be in temporal affairs. So he's going to send his orcs conquering all over the place. And of course, he ends up allying with Saruman, which uh, is pretty pretty rough. Uh, Gandalf becomes the Pope. And where in his in his encounter with Denethor, he really comes very, very close to saying this when he says, know you not that I also am a steward. Which makes one think of the papal title of vicar. Hmm. You see, he's he is the spiritual leader of all the free peoples, but not their temporal ruler. Hmm. And he is the animating principle of of uh, authority. I mean, this is why it's in his gift to ask Denethor and and then eventually successfully Faramir to surrender the the uh, authority of the steward back to its rightful rightful owner. Yeah, I'm I'm so glad you're saying this because there's a puzzling thing about Gandalf when you read the Lord of the Rings. He's he's this wizard, or that that's what everybody calls him, right? He, he's a wizard, right? And so you're going through the Lord of the Rings figure, and he's going to be just like blasting people with magic and stuff. But in fact, I don't know if you ever noticed, Gandalf doesn't do that much magic. No. There's there's little moments here and there, right? But it's certainly not his key role is to run around casting magic at people, right? His role, as you said, is uh, to persuade, to call people to do the right thing, yeah. right? And it's, it's to be an authority. To be an authority and to yeah. to stand up for the the spiritual principles which the which the temporal leadership are stuck having to fight for. And that uh, that again, very very much like the Middle Ages. It's it's also interesting to bear in mind too, that when you look at the Guelphs and Ghibellines, which is an endlessly fascinating uh, topic for me, the the papal Guelphs and the imperial Ghibellines. What's interesting is that if you study their basic texts, they were in agreement on all the the, the fundamentals. Hmm. Their their arguments came out in specific applications. Which, oddly enough, and I, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of ourselves here, but one of the things you see drop throughout Lord of the Rings are sort of historical motifs that are transformed almost into Jungian archetypes. So uh, just to give you one example, there are a couple of others I'll leave until later if they come up. But it's interesting the way the siege of Gondor starts out like the siege of Constantinople. And there too, although he wasn't present, the Pope of the day was trying to rally the West to defend Constantinople. And he did manage to get a few people to send some stuff, but not many. Uh, and it looks like Constantinople was going to fall. But then it morphs into the siege of Vienna in 1683, mm -hmm. complete with the Roverim playing Jan Sovjeski in the Poles. <laughs> I mean, it, it, is, it, it is really quite an amazing tour de force. And if you know your history, uh, you can see... I don't know how conscious Tolkien was of those two things. But as I say, if you reread the, the, uh, the siege portions of the book, you'll see how amazingly it goes seamlessly 
from Constantinople, 1453, to Vienna, 1683. Mm. And of course, the other theme which um, Nathan and I have discussed previously on this channel is the Battle of Chalons between Flavius Aetius, the uh, Visigothic king Theodoric, and Attila the Hun, obviously, yes. and Theodoric et etymologically um, being the closest thing to a stand-in for Theoden that we have. Um, so yes, I, th I think that's that, that's quite comprehensive Can... regards to political religion. But before we move on, um, uh, Nathan and uh, Mr. Patriarch, is there anything you want to bring up? I, w I wanted to touch on uh, the ro the role of institutional religion because you mentioned in the Lord of the Rings, there's not much of a presence of it, not recognisable anyway to somebody uninitiated. But in the fall of Numenor, we do see an institutional religion, and it's quite interesting because yes. it involves uh, a Maya. Uh, kind of like the Astari playing an advisory role to the the men, the the men of Numenor, and uh, but misleading them. Yes. In this case, our Pharazon, um, the king of Numenor, the new. I should put out for context that the Numenorians uh, did believe in Iluvatar, that they acknowledge yes. that there is one god, but at this point they have become somewhat disenfranchised or alienated from the Valar. They are seeking after power and wealth and riches. And uh, they come into conflict with Sauron because he's uh, in Middle-earth claiming to be king of men. He recognizes their strength and their power. And so rather than facing them in open combat, he submits to them, but he becomes something of a spiritual advisor. And he teaches our Pharazon that actually Eru, the one, is a myth created by the Valar to enchain men in servitude so that they will not be able to ascend to greater power to dominion over all of the earth Opiate. the original the, the mythical opiate of the masses yes <laughs> precisely it's a, it's, exactly. a, it's a marxist approach and uh and uh and also one of the key reasons why our farazan uh wanted to go west was to seize immortality that was what the later numenorean kings became obsessed with so you had uh the uh the opiate of the masses on the one hand, and then also like uh, transhumanism <laughs> in Tolkien. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the quest and the desire for immortality at all costs. But then there's, and, there's uh, a dramatic there's this... irony. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, oh no, I, I, I was just riffing on this. And uh, there was a great line in, um, I believe it was Return of the King, where it was talking about um, just sort of the decline of the West. Uh, and of course, you know, this is in the third age after a Farazan and the, the destruction of Numenor, but um, it was talking about sort of how the line of kings of Gondor failed. And it, it said something like um, uh, aged lords sat in their towers, musing on heraldry, and then th thought of the uh, pondered the mysteries of the stars and child and uh, counted the names of their ancestors dearer than the names of sons. So there's a uh, an implied decadence and a weariness, uh, mm. uh, a, a preoccupation with the arcane at the expense of, uh, I guess, sort of the. It's 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 basically a critique of a sort of gnostic impulse <laughs> among the elite of uh, Gondor at the time. So, and what we ended up seeing, like what you're saying, to bring it back, Nathan, is the uh, the Numenorians basically had that impulse, but then they took it all the way to their destruction. Well, they, they begin to worship Melkor with the yes. promise of achieving all power. And ironically, this pursuit of eternal life ends up with Sauron presiding in the temple, kill, uh, committing blood sacrifices, basically. So killing mm. people. Um, and that's the institutional religion we see in, in Numenor, which I think is quite an interesting thing you wouldn't necessarily expect from, from Tolkien if you, from a first, at first sight. Fascinating. So um, I think, thank you both, um, Nathan and Mr. Patriarch, for those contributions. I think um, we'll have to move on, though. I think touching the idea of monarchy, Charles has already um, uh, set up much of the groundwork, but just to uh, give a few more points. Um, obviously, Charles has brought up this idea of stewardship the stewardship of Denethor, in part the idea that Gandalf represents a form of stewardship. But in addition, you can argue that the king of Rohan is a form of steward. He is, of course, a vassal to the king of Gondor. And the king of Gondor is not the autocrat or the god king of the, Numenor of the Numenorians or the, their descendants. He is 
in many ways a steward of, again, the authority of the one Eru Iluvatar. And bringing this back to the Catholic conception, within the Catholic conception of monarchy and indeed the idea of the Pope, um, all authority is vested in the sacramental aspect of God. Um, explicitly in the idea of God. And if a king usurps the right authority or the legitimate authority, um, he ceases to become a rightful king and becomes a tyrant, essentially. And of course, this is um, illustrated within the story of the fall of Numenor and the subsequent punishment for the, um, the race of Numenorians. So within that, you have this idea of stewardship, Catholic stewardship wedded to the idea of um, uh, temporal authority within Lord of the Rings. But more than that, there is this idea of nominal headship. So within the elven kingdoms, the elves, of course, I have um, an image of uh, Thwanduil, uh, the, the king of the, the woodland realm in the center. Uh, you have the high king within the elves. So for example, you have Gilgalad. In addition for men, the king of Gondor, um, in this case, Aragorn becomes king of Arnor as well, is essentially the stand-in for the Holy Roman Emperor. He is the supreme temporal authority, but it's only in a nominal sense, as we're alluding to the idea of the, um, the true medieval polity. Uh, this isn't the authority to remake the world or to impose your will allow someone like Sauron explicitly. Um, this is essentially a trust which is afforded to, and a status which is afforded to the king of the Gondor and Arnor. And in this case, in the literal case that um, Arnor can be seen as the Western Roman Empire and Gondor can be seen as the Eastern Roman Empire, as you bring in the idea that Minas Tirith is Constantinople, come Vienna, come the Holy Roman Empire, all of these elements of, you know, Roman authority or, you know, the Holy Roman authority is wedded to this idea. Hence, politically, we've established this idea of the um, of the patch quilt that we've um, been going into. Um, so with that set up, does anyone want to elaborate on any of those um, broad points that I brought up? Well, the, just big statement on monarchy here from Tolkien, um, or, uh, the highest level. Um, you know, as an anarchist, of course, I, I'm happy to point to the Lord of the Rings as the most widely read salvo against power in the sense that Tolkien meant it, right, uh, that you can find, right? And yet within this anti-power or anarchistic work, he paints the return of the king in a way that's not only stirring. I mean, I, I, I don't know how you couldn't read could read about Aragorn without being sort of moved, right? Not only stirring, but it's even tender. I just want to bring up a detail. Do you remember, and I hope I'm getting my details right, um, Aragorn establishes his authority among the people of the city of Gondor, in part by sneaking in anonymously to heal people. Hmm. And there's some old saying about the, the king, the king's the healing of the king's hands or something like that. Yeah, the hands of the king are the hands of the healer. Yes, <laughs> the hands of the thank you. The hands of the king are the hands of the healer. Right, and and um, he 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 isn't coming in to present himself as king, so he comes in, you know, not in a royal way, right? But to come in just to minister to to the people, and the word gets around, and and this is part of the reason they are able to accept that he is the rightful king. I mean, wow, what a sort of a, a moving portrait of of what a king can be. Well, anyway. it, 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 well, no, you're, you're quite right, and I mean, in in the medieval concept that we've been looking at, uh, and again, as with everything else human, not everyone always lived up to it, but uh, the idea was that kingship was a kind of service to one's subjects, for whom you had to be willing to die. Uh, it's also interesting to bear in mind that during the 17th century in England, uh, you had the struggle of the Stuarts, first Charles I of Cromwell, then James II and William of Orange, and then the Jacobites, epitomized by Bonnie Prince Charlie, who arrives anonymously in the uh, in a Scottish island with seven men. <laughs> you know, he's going to take on the British army. <laughs> and he does. He gets all the way down to Derby in the end. But you had similar things in Spain with the Carlist Wars, in Portugal with the Miguelist Wars, uh, and in France with the stress and strain between the Legitimists and the Orleanists. Um, for that matter, in Italy and Germany with their wars of unification, you had the conflict between the traditional idea of monarchy, which was basically medieval, uh, 
and the new state, whether it be a crowned republic or a republic. Well, uh, in all of this, and again, it's one of these motifs like Constantinople to, uh, to Vienna, uh, Aragorn starts out as a Bonnie Prince Charlie figure. Uh, he's, you know, like Bonnie Prince Charlie, he takes to the heather, sleeps rough. He has a band of men around him and so on and so forth. But he ends up with Charlemagne, the restorer of the empire. He goes from being one Charles to another. Not that yes. it's because of my name. I just thought I'd point that out. <laughs> but the, the thing is that these two are motifs in history that are very... You know, the I, I don't have it memorized, luckily for all of us, but the song of victory at Gondor that the eagles sing, your king has come among you. And, uh, and all all's going to be hunky-dory. Uh, I didn't use those words. Um, that is a very, very powerful image. And, of course, what's one of the first things that the new king does? Well, he does what medieval kings everywhere did. He confirms his peoples, his various subjects, some high, some low. He confirms them in their rights and privileges. Uh, and that, again, it's not a remaking, you'll notice. It's a repairing sometimes, because mm. Rohan is Rohan now. The the Gondorian province that was there before the Rohirrim came was totally empty. No more Dunedain were living there, and that's why Rohan got it in the first place, because it was empty. And it, and it stays with them. There's no Rohan for Gondor. They're confirmed in their rights. Um so he he upholds proper authority, is your point, exactly. as opposed to undermining it to his own ends. Yeah, exactly. not, not, to put too, Shire. not to put too fine a point on it, Charles. The good Christian king is ideally, to be blunt, Christ-like. Yeah. Right. Well, that is, he wins the trust of the people by serving them, rather than using his position to, like, seize all power to himself. Right. Right. And and yeah. he's willing to die for them. Right. I mean, that's yeah. why Aragorn puts himself in the midst of the fray. It was uh, Otto von Habsburg who uh, made a very interesting comment, which was that monarchy in Europe began to die when kings ceased to follow, to lead their men into battle. Yeah, wow. And it's, mm. and it's interesting. When, that, when did that happen, by the way? I've, I've over, wondered about that term. Over the course of the 18th century, uh, okay. at different times, and into the 19th. Yes. Franz well, Joseph, I can, I can, I sorry, I can, modern, I can say, modern, say about this. Yes, I mean, I mean, obviously, times, right? obviously, um, Charles and I will both bring up the fact that um, Franz Josef fought at the Battle of Solferino yeah. against um, Napoleon the Third. Of course, Napoleon the First um, fought at battles in this country. The final king, I believe, to fight on the battlefield was George the Second. Second. Um, if you also include um, Bonnie Prince Charlie, um, yeah. but yes, yeah, so in this country, it's been you know. 250 years, but in the case of Europe, um, uh, slightly more recently, uh, when it comes to the Russian Tsar, I mean, there was this notion that the you know the Tsar also had to lead troops onto this, onto battle, and so Nicholas II definitely had this conception. But of course, when you apply this to something like World War One, it doesn't have the same romantic element as well, you no, say, for example, associate with um, previous battles, and so there was no. Um, you know, literal partaking of the battle, and it was something that he was greatly criticized for. It, it's true, uh, although, of course, uh, Emperor Karl of, uh, blessed Emperor Karl of Austria was at the was front. Was a soldier, absolutely, yes. Yeah, and Victor Emmanuel III of Italy was at the front, and King Albert of the but, Belgians. What I'm enough, surprised by the, with this is how recent it is. I thought it was a long time ago. It, from, no. In the span of what we think of as sort of European history, right, let's say the last 2,000 years or, or so, this is just yesterday, and no, this isn't it, that long. No. Well, I mean, your own Edward VIII in England, when he was Prince of Wales, uh, not only was he at the front, he had a chauffeur shot in the head right in front of him. Uh, you know, if it, if it had gone, he wasn't supposed to be there, of course, but he was. And if, uh, if he'd been standing a little bit differently, it would have been him instead of the chauffeur. But nevertheless, it, it, over the course of the 19th century, it became less expected. And then World War I was a bit of an, up, of an upswing to it. Interestingly, Otto himself uh, sent his two younger brothers to the Tyrol 
during World War II to fight with the resistance against the Germans. Uh, he himself was in Washington advising FDR. But uh, that, that was the last, you could almost say the last time European royals fought in a European war in Europe, because I think members of the British royal family have fought in Afghanistan, the Falcons and so on. But uh, the two or three youngest Habsburg sons uh, fighting in the Tyrol against the Nazis. Which is kind of a great thing, I think. Wonderful. So, um, I mean, in terms of like thinking of monarchy, I mean, obviously, um, Charles, you have um, anticipated the idea of the obvious sort of motif of restorationism. You brought up um, legitimism, you brought up Carlism, Miguelism, uh, you know, Stuart restorationism, and of course, the idea of Charlemagne. The idea of Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Empire, that sort of completes this motif. Um, it was one of the topics I was actually considered doing a video on for Talking Day, the idea that um, Aragon is the, you know, the closest thing to a pure embodiment of Charlemagne. That and that he's received into Minas Tirith, he's received, you know, Charlemagne is received into Rome, and um, his authority is confirmed by a pope um, in a very similar fashion. So other than, I mean, because we've essentially covered the aspects of restorationism, are there any other aspects of monarchy in particular, um, Nathan and Mr. Patriarch, uh, that you would like to cover before we move on? I was thinking, I guess. The... Go ahead, Mr. Patriarch. Okay, I'll, I'll just make it real quick. Uh, the only thing I, I uh, f didn't fully say the, <clears throat> the quote early on, but it said, uh, from Return of the King, the hands of the king are the hands of the of a healer, and thus the rightful king shall ever be known. So <clears throat> there's a notion of that not only is the monarch uh, a healer, but that is how you know he is the king. He comes to restore. You, he has a noblesse oblige, um, I guess, sort of uh, telos <laughs> purpose. That that's that's sort of what he tries to achieve for his people. And I guess that's sort of how you could uh, compare the idealized version of the rightful king. In Lord of the Rings, as opposed to, you know, would be usurpers or power mongers. But um, yeah, I guess that's the only thing I uh, wanted to add. Just, just to build on all these other points, I, I think an important motif here is the the kind of idea of King Arthur's return to England and restoration. Um, the idea Aragorn very much seems like an Arthurian character. He carries a sword which establishes his right to be. Uh, mm. as the heir of Isildur and uh, of course Arthur, uh, King Arthur has his sword from the Lady of the Lake um, and I think uh, I'm, I'm making a bit of an assumption here so correct me if I'm wrong but I'm primarily drawing from C.S. Lewis's That Hideous Strength and obviously Lewis and Tolkien were very good friends and shared a, very, a lot of similar views and in that he talks about how each nation has its own character or essential um, culture and for England, it is the the culture is that which is um, maintained by the Pendragons, the descendants of King Arthur. And at various points, they need to kind of in, break into history to re turn England back to its proper roots, back to its proper way. And I think you can see a very similar idea with the character of Aragorn, and then the extension of his rule into the Shire through the Hobbits returning and freeing the shire from the tyranny of of sharky it's a restoring of of kind of england through that through that arthurian myth wonderful thank you nathan um so i mean we've anticipated um a, a, quite a lot of this already so we needn't dwell too much on this subject um unless anyone wants to pick it up but um radlet this of course is a subject very close to your heart uh, which is the idea of centralization versus decentralization and the idea of talking as um a form of positive anarchist not the bomb throwing type of anarchist he was quick right right which is the he said he said what the mustache twirling uh, I'm not the mustache twirling, bomb throwing sort. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, oh, and by the way, I I I, I mentioned Knut Ladin. Um, th this, I think, um, just knowing that such people exist, I think, is is useful. I try to be one myself, right? <laughs> that is, someone who um, calls themselves an anarchist is is uh, sort of radically anti-political, you could say, um, but combines that with 
well, not being insane, hopefully. I, I'm yeah. trying. Um, you know, I, you know, someone like Kanalt Ladin, someone like Tolkien, you can just feel that they were um, sensible, good men, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of um, the, the scare tactics that go around, you know, what would we do without the state to take care of us? You know, all those scare tactics, it, it calms you down just to meet a gentleman like this sort of person and, and to see that they don't have a wild look in their eyes and they don't want to bring chaos and disorder, right? And then that maybe can get you past that initial shock of them calling themselves an anarchist and, and, hear, and then you can listen to them and hear them talk about um, uh, proper authority and that uh, anarchy in the sense that a Tolkien or a Kanot Ladin means, uh, uses it uh, doesn't mean uh, chaos and disorder. In fact, from the right-wing anarchist point of view, you might say, um, the, uh, our current situation is chaotic, right? Um, it's, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, an undermining of authority. Um, it's this, this hunger, and this is what uh, Lord of the Rings pictures so well. Um, academic agent was just talking about this. That this picture of power uh, that you have in Tolkien, you see it in some of the great political thinkers as well, power that has a hunger that never seems to be sated. However much power it grabs to itself, it finds one person that isn't going along with it and it wants to crush them too, right? I, I, from the Bible, I think of the book of Esther. Haman is honored. He's second only to the king. Everyone honors him. And one guy, Mordecai, won't bend the knee and he wants to genocide his whole people right? <laughs> you follow me? It's, it's, it's got this hunger for utter domination. Um, our own horrible government uh, state, uh, the U.S. state, talks about full spectrum dominance. I mean, they really, they use the words, right? I mean, the, the Sauron could have used that term. Hey, all I'm, asking for, all I'm asking for is full spectrum dominance over uh, Middle Earth. Is that so much? You know, no, right? no, 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 I'm fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, that, that, that centralization, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is when we say the word centralization, decentralization, as Tolkien would tell us, they're Latinate words rather than good, hearty German words. And, and they can feel a little abstract and bloodless. Um, but uh, Tolkien brings home that power has a hunger for domination. Uh, I love this phrase, libido dominandi, mm. the, the, the desire, the lust to dominate, mm. right? That, that is what we, uh, Tolkien is trying to portray for us. And he does so, and he also points something else out about that. As you very rightly point out, um, the Shire and any place that's well ruled in Middle Earth orients itself toward an order toward a pre-existing order, but it's not an imposed hungry order. And it, it, to a great degree, it is orderly. Whereas, and this is, uh, this is the thing, hungry power can dominate, but it cannot really create a real order. Why do I say this? Think of the orcs. They are, unless they've got somebody to ride roughshod on them, they're killing each other. And the, the, the order that Aragorn represents, that Gandalf represents, is in a certain sense self-sustaining. It looks after itself. It doesn't need to be imposed in such, in, in such a manner. Whereas Sauron's order of power, unless, he's constantly running back and forth trying to keep his lackeys in line. And as I say, when he doesn't, they start killing each other. And exactly. in the real world, that's exactly what happens. If you think of any major dictatorship, you think of the Soviets, you think of the Nazis, you think of our friends in China, they're all cliquish. They're all constantly going after each other's throats. And very often, that facilitates the downfall of the regime. I guess this plays into the actual metaphysics or the Catholic metaphysics behind the Lord of the Rings and Tolkien's world too, because... There is a central power. There is something that governs everything and every event takes place according to its will, but it's it's God. But it's not a compulsive power. It works through the natural courses of 
of creatures and through their free actions. It's this you know, Thomist idea of first and second causes, or primary and secondary causes. Whereas when creatures try to take that power, like Sauron or Saruman, because of the na because they're not the creator, they're creatures, they can only compete with others' wills, and so have to subjugate or annihilate them. And as you, you say that, that's impossible, really, in the long run. So it, there is this central power, but they're, they're trying to usurp it. And it's, it is another point, uh, when you're, you mentioned the metaphysical, one of the things about the Lord of the Rings, and I, I believe, consciously or otherwise, it's one of the reasons why it's so popular, is that in with and under everything else it does, it's also a meditation on free will versus uh, providence. Uh, everyone plays their part. You know, the, old, the old saying, God rides straight with crooked lines. Who is it who finally accomplishes the quest? It's Gollum. And he does so pursuing his own selfish interests. With no good to him, because presumably he damns himself. It doesn't do him any good. But he is the one, ultimately, who saved Middle Earth. Now, mind you, he couldn't have done it if Frodo and uh, Sam hadn't gotten there. Yeah. But of course, if Frodo hadn't spared his life out of pity, he wouldn't have been there, and Frodo would have blown the whole thing sky high. Um, there's a there are a couple of other times in the book where that you, you sort of see the play come out very definitely. One is the famous thing where Gandalf says to Frodo, "Well, one thing you may be sure of, uh, Bilbo was intended to find the ring and not by its maker." That it's it's a it's a very small line, but it's a very important one. And then the other is uh, during the um, one of the appendices. Um, I'm, here's where I'm sorry, Radlib, that I'm not like one of your friends who's got everything memorized. <laughs> but uh, there's a wonderful uh, spot there where Gandalf is talking about what would have happened had he not met. Thor and Oakenshield when Thor and the dwarves were going to go to in smog. Uh, the, he relates about what would have happened if smog had still been there. Long list of woes ending with Dragonfire and Lorien and perhaps no Queen and Gondor. And then he says, but none of that occurred because I happened to run across Thor and Oakenshield one night at the Inn and Bree. A chance meeting, as we say in Middle Earth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to go back to a point you were making, Charles. Um, so, uh, Charles, you wouldn't know, but everyone else knows my my show is uh, <clears throat> what is it? Um, the subhead is uh, economics, politics, history, uh, and so I want to speak as an economist for just a moment because one of the gifts of studying Austrian economics is we learn that there's a natural order to human cooperation. And when power inserts itself, it causes chaos in its natural interplay. And here's the key thing, and this is why I wanted to bring this up. It isn't stable. No. It's an illusion that you can interfere with you know, natural authority and all that and create a new stable point. Um, so, for example, Mises wrote or gave an address, I should say, in 19, 1950 called The Middle of the Road Leads to Socialism. And he didn't fully mean that, you know, he wasn't a fatalist, right? But he just meant there's a dynamic where you think you can sort of balance, you know, you can just have a little bit of power, right? <laughs> um, and it'll be okay and we'll bounce. And he says, it's just not stable. It will tend in one direction or the other. It, it will be more, power will insert itself more and more and more because as it inserts itself into the natural order, the natural economic order, there's these side effects, side effects, unintended consequences, whatever you want to call it, chaos yep. results. And so they have to step in and try to Band-Aid, put a Band-Aid on that. Yep. Right. But then that causes a problem. So they have to put a Band-Aid on that, right? You, you follow. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so this, is, um, this is one of the things that economics teaches us is that um, it is an illusion that we can uh, play with fire. <laughs> it, well, it, it never yeah. works. And it's it's an illusion ultimately that we can control it. Uh, exactly. I mean, one one of the things that that's happening now back in California, 
where I've lived most of my life, is that there's now apparently a thriving trade in phony vax certificates. Right. <laughs> well, of course there is. It's like prohibition. Of course there's going to be bootleg booze. Right. What do you think? Yeah. That's what happens. And again, you, you, as you say, the Band-Aid, you know, you run from hole to hole in the boat trying, right. to, trying to plug it. But it, it's not going to work because that's not how these things operate. It's not how human nature is. If you, uh, there is no need, however obscure, that someone will not try to fill. And the more and you try to fight it, the worse it gets. Exactly. And so I, I think someone already made the point, but it's so important. I just want to really highlight this. What, what this dynamic means is that this is why you're going to end up with coercion every time. Oh. Right? Well, and then because you get a beautiful... If, if you're going to try to impose this artificial order, there are going to be holes in the boat or whatever, right? And oh. you're going to try persuasion and, you know, so on and so forth. But eventually you're going to have to bring the hammer hammer down. You're going to have to show the iron fist because you it's just not natural and it just won't work without ultimately pushing people around. And the, the problem with that, of course, is that once you start down that road of pushing them around, where do you stop? And the other problem is people will sometimes push back. Yeah, right. Blowback is uh, what the CIA calls it, Charles. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly <laughs> right. And uh, our friends in the scouring of the Shire are a wonderful example of that. Because by the time they came back from the quest, the Shire was ready to blow. They, they were. They, they, they really had had enough. If they'd come back maybe two months earlier, they might have. Things might have been different. Right. But. Right. but they got there just when people had had enough. I, I have to admit that one of my favorite lines in the uh, or, or titles in the um, uh, Scouring of the Shire are the sharers and the gatherers. <laughs> I love those yeah. guys, the right. sharers and gatherers. <laughs> but no, they uh, uh, it it really. It's, it's a perennial part of the human condition. Uh, but what makes it uh, more difficult in our time, and this too, uh, we haven't really touched on this, but this too is something that uh, Tolkien saw. And that is, of course, the growth in uh, technology uh, lends itself to the concentration of power. And that um, that's simply the way it is, because, of course, those who have the... Uh, if you go to a money economy, as we did, and I'm not saying we shouldn't have, we couldn't have, we, but the fact that we did led, of course, to concentration of more power in the hands of those who had more money, as opposed to simple land. And then, uh, just to um, sorry, just to um, stop you, Charles. Um, no. If it's possible, I'd I'd just like to um, uh, halt your comments regarding industrialization because obviously that's a, a key theme which we'll come back to slightly later. But moving on from your um, theme on scaring the Shire, of course, um, Nathan Hood and I uh, did discuss this in a previous stream today. Uh, but there is an element, uh, one element which I want to bring up, which is going to act as a tangent for when we later discuss uh, Tolkien's philosophy on war. Uh, which is, of course, the idea that um, despite this, you can say, you know, libertarian and Kapistan idol <laughs> that the Shire represents to some extent, um, I'm, I'm using those um, terms in jest, um, you, of course, it is susceptible to this takeover by Lotto and, of course, his alliance with Sharky and the ruffians and imposing of the order of the extra sheriffs. Um, so that's one aspect, the inherent vulnerability of the system, which comes into the idea of conflict later on. And then, of course, there is this idea that you have this um, uh, this source of agitation within the Shire, the frustration of the hobbits, and yet it requires the resolution and the leadership of the um, four hobbits to bring the Shire out of this tyranny um to match that idea so it's not that Tolkien is you know advocating for some form of you know absolute individualism um no. it's clear I believe in the resolution of the scouring of the Shire that um leadership is a quality which he admires greatly and it is exhibited in the Hobbits but before we move on to um we'll briefly talk about Tolkien's views on um nationhood and um and race uh Nathan and Mr Patriarch is there anything you want to say hello 
Nathan, you got anything, bud? <laughs> um, no. no. <laughs> well. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just one more comment real quick on the de <laughs> we, we talked a lot about centralization, just on the decentralization aspect. I mean, it's sort of obvious to point out, but with the Shire, Tolkien uh, paints it very lovingly, right? And we love the Shire. The reader loves the Shire, right? And, and so he, he not only... Um, you know, you can look at it again from the sort of dry abstract point of view about, you know, centralization, decentralization, anarchy and so forth. But but he just emotionally gets you to enjoy the, the Shire. Right. It seems like that would be an OK place to live. And the fact that there's not some sort of massive state domineering over you, it's like, yeah, but maybe it, maybe it would be OK to be, be that way. Right. So he just paints a compelling picture. Wow. Oh. So, um, yes, moving would, on to, oh, I, oh, sorry, I, sorry, yes, yes, Mr. Patriarch. No problem. I guess I would just say, uh, in um, honor of academic agents, um, when you see the return of the hobbits to the Shire, <clears throat> you have essentially playing out before us the need for a vanguard elite <laughs> to right. sort of arise <laughs> and sort of uh, organize the hobbits and get them to sort of reclaim their homeland so i guess that's just sort of a little uh interesting comment about i guess sort of human nature and uh group psychology sociology is that even though people will t tolerate a lot of nonsense but essentially unless and i guess this is sort of one of the themes running throughout the um, Lord of the Rings is that the men of Gondor, the Rohirrim, or the hobbits in the Shire, all of them at various points are subject to pressures from the outside. And yet they seem to be powerless to do anything about it until essentially you have the, you know, the vanguard, <laughs> whether it's uh, it comes in the form of Gandalf to sort of break the curse of Theoden and then sort of rally. Um, uh, who's that? I, I, I can't remember his name in the movie. It's Aomir, but in the in the books, it's not. It's somebody else. Glam. I couldn't bring somebody. Yeah. Eric and brand. Yeah. Eric and brand. Mm. And uh, same thing in the the Shire. So you have Frodo. Sam, Mary, and Pippin come back, and they've sort of been tested by the outside world. This isn't their first rodeo, and they're coming to sort of organize and sort of bring order back to the Shire. So I guess that's um, just an interesting little uh, uh, snippet into the the, uh, the state of human nature uh, it, on display within Tolkien. So <laughs> it's not uh, it's not pure anarchy. There's still leadership. There's still hierarchy, but uh, yeah absolutely uh, all very important yeah. points to make yeah. so yes um radlib <laughs> i'm going to um touch on your dreaded territory i'm going to bring up a little bit of the law just to um introduce us to this topic on um on lineage and um and race and lord of the rings obviously you know among the hobbits there are you know the dwarves there are the elves uh there are the men uh there are the celestial beings um the maya the ainur uh, the Valar, and then of course they we have um, uh, the creatures, the corrupted creatures, the creatures of Morgoth, uh, most prominently the orcs. Um, Columbo did a, a wonderful video earlier on today regarding the caste and system of hierarchy within the and the breeds of hobbits in particular. So I won't have to go over that again. But within the elven class in particular, of course, there is already established a hierarchy within the races. So the elves have immortality, whereas the men, of course, have men's gift, which is the idea of mortality. Uh, within the elves, there are various groups. So, for example, you have the um, the first uh, three elven pairings, and then you have you know, various clans. You have the Minyar clan, the Tatyar clan, uh, the Lindar, and this later sort of progresses into the, the Vanyar, the Noldor, uh, the Teleriand. And then branches off further from there. Um, sometimes all these groups are referred to as the Eldar, but even that isn't you know, quite precise. Within the Dwarven society, of course, um, there is a special um, honor held to Durin's folk, the lineage of Durin. Um, within the idea of men in particular, um, of course, men have different lifespans. So for example, Aragorn, 
as one of the uh, Dúnedain, uh, has a much longer lifespan than the average man. On average, men live for about um, 80 years, you know, roughly around the same um, lifespan as we do. Um, however, the Numenorians um, lived, I think, roughly, they could live up to about sort of 400 years, if I'm correct. And um, of course, you also have um, half elves. So, for example, um, Elros, who could live to um, 500. So, contained within the Lord of the Rings, there are various you know, hierarchies, lineages, um, races. And of course, during here, I have the image of the um, of the Council of Elrond during the the Fellowship of the Ring, the gathering of the um, the races who are not affiliated with um, Morgoth or not affiliated with Sauron. And so despite the fact that we have all of these um, uh, ethnic divides, and of course, the, the allusions to the various conflicts between the group is, you know, are, are exposed. And of course, the hobbits within this scheme represent an even you know, a further anachronism. I want to bring back to this idea which um, Charles and um, Bradley brought up earlier about the Christian res publica, the unification of all of these people under some form of um, uh, religious structure. In this case, it's service to the correct order of Eru Iluvatar, as opposed to the perverted order of Melkor. Uh, so with that established, does anyone have anything they would like to say? <laughs> well, I think you've found a lovely way to bring up a spicy topic. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I have been thinking a lot about uh, capital D diversity. And so I've been meaning to make a video that this year I'll finally do it, um, that I, I mean to call the diversity heresy. And let me just tell you the argument of it real quick and then I think the application would be clear. And, and that is that um, like so many things that come out of the post-Christian order, you might say, um, we have ideals that are some kind of perversion of Christian of a Christian ideal, right? So in the scriptures, um, it talks about what we're seeing in this image. It says that every tongue will confess, every knee will bow. Um, people from every tribe, language, nation will be united by faith in Christ, right? So through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, you have. Um, unity uh, across uh, nations and tribes and so forth that might otherwise be hostile to each other. Paul, Paul in the scriptures talks about the mystery, the mystery of, you know, uh, tribes that should be against each other uh, being united and part of one body with Christ as the head, right? So that's the biblical vision. And that, I think, is what Tolkien gives us a little taste of here with the alliance and the fellowship um, in the Lord of the Rings, right? What is the false version of this? Well, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's unity without Christ, right? It's you know we're we're gonna we're gonna push everybody together, and we're gonna make them get along. <laughs> um, but there's not gonna we don't need any Holy Spirit to do it. We don't need Christ as the head to do it. We can have so to speak every language, tribe, and nation, we can have like the body of the church without the head, right? And that I think is the perversion that we, we suffer under now, under the name of, you know, capital D diversity. Let the um, Haradrim into the Shire, bigot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right, right. So, so yeah, so hopefully you, you see where I'm coming from here is that um, I think Tolkien does a great job of showing that there aren't just there are petty differences, but there are also sort of deep divides. Like the dwarves seem to have almost a different set of values from the elves, right? Um, Tolkien describes them as, you know, the things they love, the things they care about are just totally different. They they love like rock. Yes. And the elves love growing yeah. things, right? They have uh, Bradley, sorry, sorry, Bradley, divisions. if yeah. you'll indulge me, I, I just want to yeah. bring up a, a little bit of um, hated lore again. Uh, but yeah. of course, you <laughs> Within the um, the races, of course, the um, the elves have this. They are essentially the first children of um, Eru Iluvatar. However, the dwarves were created by Aule, and they were created in defiance. They were actually created first um, before the before the elves, and so baked into this idea, of course, Aule wanted um, to create a race who would appreciate his crafts, because of course, Aule was the um, the Ainur of craft of craftsmen. 
And um, so baked into this idea is this original friction of um, Aule wanting to bring his race into the world. And of course, then you have Eru Uluvatar insisting that it is the elves who will become the first children. And of course, the men, by contrast, are, are really just, you know, an an afterthought. I mean, I believe their name is um, uh, Etani, i.e. the afterborn. Right. So, yes. so bring this bring this up, the real differences between the races in Lord of the Rings it is meant to say that Tolkien does not do the thing of, you know, we just got to realize that we're really all the same and let's just hold hands and sing Kumbaya. That is not his perspective. That's not what yeah. he gives us. He says these people really have, they really have different perspectives on life. <laughs> and yet, and yet they work together because they have, as you say, a, a spiritual center, a spiritual uniting point, right? And it's, it's, that, it's that uniting point that allows them to overcome those very deep differences. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the Battle of the Five Armies uh, was going to be a real mess until uh, our orc friends showed up. Yes. And that, you know, mm. they, they, they helped remind everyone because this is true in history. You know, uh, peoples have all sorts of differences with one another, even to the point of bloodshed. And then along, along come the Huns and the Turks or whoever is like, well, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah you're, you're kind of annoying. And in some ways, I hate your stinky guts. But these people are beyond the pale. Right. Brothers fight until the cousins come over. And exactly. then they yes. die. Right. Yeah. And of course, historically, um, you know, I hate to bring up another controversial point. Um, obviously, I think we're going to veer in too much into the uh, implications of um, immigration and the scurrying of the Shire. Um, but there is one point, um, uh, particularly regarding the nature of the Crusades. I, I know um, that is obvious, but it essentially follows the same logic. And of course, aspects such as the, the Battle of Lepanto and the very long ongoing war between Christendom and Catholic Christendom and the advance of the Ottoman Empire, which we've um, uh, chronicled extensively on this channel. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's if you look at some of the great battles like the Siege of Belgrade or um, anything you like, Lepanto, uh, these multinational thrown together forces of peoples and nations who are normally at one another's throats. Um, it's obvious to see, again, how conscious in Tolkien's mind, who knows, but you see the historical motifs. I mean, all, all the way down to the eight nations at the Boxer Rebellion. Mm. You know, it, it uh, pulling together, well, in his own time, in his own time, the uh, then United Nations, as they were called, fighting the Germans. Um, you know, he uh, in World War One, of course, he uh, he after all fought in France, and uh, the Western Front wasn't quite as varied as the Eastern Front, but they had a lot of different nationalities on the Allied side. So, the the idea of pulling together for a common cause, uh, despite sometimes very serious uh, differences, you know, it's 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 inherent in history, and he makes it come alive as he does everything uh, in a very in a very particular way. Uh, although I have to say, uh, in the movie version of The Hobbit, where they managed to cram one movie into three, uh, the whole dwarf elf forbidden love thing, I could have really done without. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. I, So, oh, oh, you're talking about in the Hobbit films. Yeah, yes. I, I, yeah, the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really, I really, <laughs> I really could have done without that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know why that was in there, but I, I will say that, uh, I will say that uh, Tolkien's realism within the context of his fantasy is is very, very much here. Like at one point, well, I hadn't heard it was the elves that started it. Well, I hadn't heard it was the dwarves. <laughs> it's exactly how these things would go. Just just have one more poke at the movies, Charles. I, I remember watching them, and, and uh, there'd be moments where I'd be like, that dialogue felt a little flat, and then I'd realize, <laughs> oh, that's because it wasn't from the books, and they, they wrote yes. it. You know? <laughs> no, and, and, see, again, they, they had to cram uh, one movie into three, 
and that made it very difficult uh, yeah. because a single movie would have done The Hobbit well. Yes. I think, um, Charles, one of the <laughs> most baffling experiences of watching The Hobbit, because, you know, of, of course, you know, all of us are um, uh, Lord of the Rings fanatics to some extent. Um, it must have been halfway through the first one. I can't even remember what they were called, the individual sections. Um, but I had this weird sensation come over me um, where I essentially told myself, shouldn't I be enjoying this? <laughs> and it was a big <laughs> <fiction>. <laughs> Well... <laughs> When you this go to a film out of a sense of duty, there's a problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this, is, this is a good example, actually, of what Radlib was talking about, about this idea that everybody's the same. Because if so, why can't a Dorfin and an elf get together in a romantic relationship? Now, of right. course, knowing, knowing the, the, the law of uh, Middle-earth, that's total nonsense. But if you believe in just total equality of all species, well, then it makes perfect sense. I uh, I have yet to see a, a termite uh, queen fly off with a male ant, but who knows? It could happen, I guess. I mean, in fairness to um, uh, to Peter Jackson and um, uh, this particular, I mean, it, it, there isn't an exact equivalent, but we have to bear in mind the the story of Beren and Luthien, uh, which was in some way informed by his own relationship with Edith, yeah. and um, the especially with Elrond and Elros, the the idea of the the half elf, and it, it is a it is a re reoccurring motif, uh, but not between elves and dwarves, certainly not. Well, not with dwarves and anybody. I, I mean, yes. <laughs> uh, Tolkien's comments about dwarf women that they're very hard to distinguish yeah. from the men. You know what? Their 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 beards are softer. I don't know. Uh, it just no, no, no. Yeah, yes. someone and someone in the chat. With their, <laughs> someone their in the chat. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Patriarch. Someone in mm -hmm. the chat is mentioning um uh, the potential romance between Galadriel and Gimli. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes. <laughs> Yes, the, the the great untold story of Lord of the Rings, Galadriel and Gimli's torrid affair. Yeah. <sighs> Coming to a cinema near you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just, I'm just, I'm let, just... You let me know where that cinema is, and I won't be anywhere near it. Yeah. No, I'm I'm already dreading what they're going to do with the Silmarillion show or whatever they're planning on doing with Amazon. I'll I'll just assume it's garbage and not watch it until sort of informed otherwise. But Yes, no, this is a thing, too, and sort of what you're talking about with the dwarves. Um, so they were sort of created behind the back of Eru Iluvatar, and um, they were basically grafted in as sort of like, they, they sort of became his adoptive children. Like, so the children mm -hmm. of Iluvatar were elves and men. And um, so, yeah, the, the idea that there would be uh, a unity with this sort of, afterthought <laughs> uh you know s step stepchildren the dwarves being sort of uh you know cozy with the elves is I, I i don't know i think it's just you know sort of more quote unquote alternative lifestyles sort of on display <laughs> through cinema <laughs> um i think that's clearly what it is because if you read I mean, any of the Lord of the Rings, there's there's a notorious animosity between the the two races and not only in Lord of the Rings, but also the Silmarillion and so such. So, yeah, it's just typical I, Hollywood. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, we could go a step further. A romance between an ant and a dwarf maid. <laughs> I mean, let's break down all the barriers. Why not? I mean, there are no more ant wives, so they got to find love somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just um one point to bring up. Um obviously, you know, we're talking about um a lineage and ethnicity. Of course, the extension of that is the idea of nationhood. Uh, does anyone have any um thoughts regarding the idea of nationality within Lord of the Rings and in the legendarium and of course how this would inform Tolkien's mindset? Well, well I, I wanted to mention uh, sorry Charles, you go ahead. No, well, I was just going to say uh there is a cottage industry at the moment. Uh, in attacking uh, Tolkien as a racist and so on and so forth, which, of course, you know, everyone who has any pride in his own people is obvious, obviously hates everyone else. Um, but I, I think that it's important to bear in mind that Tolkien's different peoples uh, and their self-regard is very much a mirror of what he thought was correct himself. I mean, he loved the English. 
He really, really loved the English. But he understood why the Welsh, the Scots, the Irish, Cornish maybe, uh, would have their own amour propre, as we say in French. Um, you know, hearkening back to uh, what uh, was said earlier about C.S. Lewis in that hideous strength. Um, Rohan is Rohan. Gondor is Gondor. They're very different. They have very, very different ethoi, if I can Greekify a plural there. Uh, they were, the, the Rohirrim were barely civilized. They're, I mean, they're, they're based on northern barbarians, really. Uh, their Beowulf would have been very happy in Adorus, I'm sure, chugging his mead. Uh, whereas Gondor was Constantinople. Uh, even, they're, they're calling it stone lending. Well, that reminds me of the Slavic word for Constantinople, which was uh, Tsarigrad, mm -hmm. the city of the emperor. Mm -hmm. You know, so they've got a relationship like that, but that doesn't keep them from respecting one another. Mm -hmm. Because they have the same ultimate belief. They have the same, uh, they're, they're the same common enemies, same common allies. Uh, there's that wonderful, uh, that wonderful thing, uh, the Rohirrim, the Rohirrim poem about, uh, uh, you know, keeping, uh, keeping oaths, oaths kept, however it went, ride, ride to Gondor. They honored their alliance with Gondor in the way people of that sort would. And then in return, Aragorn honors them afterwards in the way he would each proper to each is what i'm saying and neither considered uh, neither considered to be really superior simply themselves in their own area uh, and similarly with the with the shire and above all think about it breland are uh, are hobbits and uh, human beings living side by side very distinct but still considering each other integral parts of, of the whole, a little bit like the Swiss, if you think about it, or the Belgians before they got crazy in the 60s. Uh, their integral parts, very different, secure in their differences, possibly making funny jokes about each other, <laughs> but nevertheless committed to this particular real unity within diversity, as opposed to the great big brotherhood of man as how to succeed in business without really trying tells us. Yep. I have to, th have to throw in a comment from the chat really quick. The Enrib says, as a hobbit designated female at birth, I identify as a male ent. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I, I, I want that woman in government or, or, that right. man, or, or what I, yeah. or in academia, or right, in media, right. or all three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, Nathan, I think you were speaking. That person uh, needs a job in censorship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roger, Roger Scooter makes a helpful distinction on this point, and I may, I may get the concepts bottled up which way round they go, so um, please correct me, chat. But he, he talks about how patriotism, I think it's patriotism, is this love of your country, but you want your like somebody else to love their country and love their culture and their traditions, whereas nationalism, in his view, is this idea that your nation is superior and all else must be subsumed under this, uh, unto your nation. So that's a helpful conceptual distinction. Um, but, but just coming uh, back around as well, maybe to a theological point, there's often talk about what's the best way to glory, glorify God is to live most fully as a human being. And if we apply that to the Lord of the Rings, well, what would that mean? It means not making a dwarf into a hobbit, but a dwarf living as fully as a dwarf can in the honor of Eru. It would be the same for an elf, would be the same for a hobbit, same for a, a man. Whereas this kind of egalitarianism, which again, Radlib, you were commenting on with your speaking about diversity of, we're all just individuals with, we have certain characteristics, but they're not important to the es essence of who we are. Mm -hmm. We're just monads, which all have the same properties, all the same characteristics fundamentally trying to reduce that, you're cancelling out these distinctions which God has given to each species to live out most fully. So it's a rebellion against the divine order in that respect too. 
and against true diversity, ironically. But anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, and you know, the interesting thing is uh, Radley brought up for Kurt Nadine earlier. His definition of patriotism versus nationalism was precisely the same as Tolkien's. And, and here's the example of Bohemia, where he said that a, a Bohemian patriot would love both Czechs and Sudeten Deutsch simply because they were in Bohemia. Whereas a Czech or a Sudeten Deutsch nationalist would want to see the other completely subsumed. And that's a very, that different, that, that distinction between patriotism and nationalism is something that I think has been lost on all sides and really needs to be resurrected and flown high. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I think the the natural extension of this conversation about unity and uh, patriotism, I'm actually going to probably lump these conversations in two because they are too interconnected, as ultimately was the case with um, religion, the idea of the temporal power versus the spiritual power. So here, of course, we have um, Isengard post Saruman's turn. And here we have the um, uh, the Battle at the Black Gate. Um, so essentially, you know, the this is the embodiment of unification in the face of the in the enemy. And this, of course, is the uh, corruption and despoiling of Isengard in the service of war. And of course, we've discussed elements of this in the scouring of the Shire. And of course, the major themes here are war, uh, the justification for war and the effects of industrialization. And one point that uh, Nathan Hood brought up earlier in um, his stream on uh, the Scaring the Shire is uh, Carl Schmitt's idea of the friend-enemy distinction, essentially. So um, uh, Nathan, would it be possible if you could um, lead us into this discussion? Yeah, so very briefly uh, for Carl Schmitt, a people is genuinely political if they have some awareness or that or they 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 are aware that there is an enemy which poses an existential threat to their survival as a people and thus they organize themselves in terms of their friends those who are part of this political body and their enemies those who are a threat and this he called the man ring those within the ring are those who are your friends those without are your enemies and i think it's quite interesting actually that we've just looked at the council of elrond they're all sitting in a ring we just looked at the Battle of the Black Gate where they're standing in a ring. So there's a very clear distinction between these two, who's on the right side and who's on the en enemy side. So that, that and um, I, I think you've read the book too, a, um, the, this, I can't remember his name, but he's, he, um, this author suggests that uh, for Tolkien, this is a very good model for understanding many of the conflicts within Middle Earth. Yes, yeah, so I'll find the name of the book. I, I know what you're talking about, but I'll just go and research it. Uh, but yes, you carry on, Nathan. I, I didn't have much more to add on that point. I was I was interested to hear what others thought, if that if that held true, and that friend and enemy distinction. Well, again, it's worth noting that Tolkien does not treat the war in the Lord of the Rings as, you know, it's just a big misunderstanding. Mm. You know, we could, we could really just be getting along if we, you know, uh, if our corrupt leaders weren't leading us into war or whatever. Um, a view I'm tempted to myself sometimes. Uh, but, but in Lord of the Rings, uh, the war is um, su substantive, right? It's, it's a conflict over uh, substantive differences. It, it's, it's not just something that can be easily cleared up. Um, and <clears throat> glad we're bringing up that hideous strength. Uh, it's been on my mind because my daughter, my teen daughter read it recently and we've been talking about it. Um, there's a shocking thing in that hideous strength. I bring it up, I hope you can see the parallel. Um, there de I'm sorry, that hideous strength. Go back a book, Paralandra. The second second a book in the Ransom trilogy or Space trilogy by Boas, um, they're having these uh, sort of discussions um, between uh, sort of the representative of God essentially and a, and a representative of evil, and um, and they're kind of not getting anywhere with these discussions. And then finally, uh, Ransom, the hero of the tale, concludes that he he has to kill the other guy. <laughs> and I remember reading that and being like. 
well, I did not expect this from Mr. Lewis. <laughs> um, but, but that, in fact, is where um, the story goes. And, and in fact, uh, just to be a spoiler, uh, after a long, complicated mythological sort of fight, he, he literally just, he kills him. That's the, that's the end of the argument. Um, and I, I continue to think about that. And in the same way, um, in Lord of the Rings, uh, you don't get the feeling that they're ever going to be able to, like, you know, make a treaty with Sauron, you know, come <laughs> to an understanding, right? <laughs> um, no. it, it seems to be, uh, you know, one of us is going to win and the other is going to lose. And there's no two ways about it, you know. So, so you know, I defer to Lewis and Tolkien as someone who would, I, I just my personality type, I like everybody to get along, you know. But I defer to Lewis and Tolkien that, um, you know, you be as, at peace with uh, everyone as much as you can be. But there does come a time when you have to take a stand. And, and, and right? I, 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 I certainly agree with you. I mean, bear in mind that both Lewis and Tolkien were uh, combat veterans right. uh, in World War I. And, that, and on the Western Front, it was not a lot of fun. Um, Tolkien refers to that most terrible of all things, a battle between men. Um, it, 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 war is a miserable business. And, uh, you know, the fact that we're able to kill more people with more, uh, more alacrity doesn't mean it was any less horrible before. You know, when, when you, people were using swords and spears, you chewing off one another's arms and so on, it was just horrible. Absolute horror. So, um, nevertheless, sometimes it becomes essential, uh, but only in the. It should it should never ever be done without a very 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 important reason. Uh, hence, Gandalf saying to Frodo, "You know, there uh, there are many alive today." Uh, that should be dead, and those who are those who are dead who should be alive. Can you uh, give them their lives back or take it from them? No. So, it's it is a, a terrible expedient, but at times, in the right cause for the right reason, it is unfortunately necessary. The and the Black Gate. It's interesting that that whole effort is a feint. Hmm to keep Sauron busy while right. they hope, they hope mm. Frodo, <laughs> and they have no, no proof that Frodo is anywhere near Mount Doom. And they certainly don't know if he's going to persevere. Fortunately, they don't know he's not going to, and Gollum will save the day. I think if they'd known that, they'd, <laughs> they might have been a little more upset. But I mean, they're, sometimes last stands are necessary. And remember, this was written not long after Dunkirk, which I'm sure was very fresh in his mind. Um, sometimes, sometimes you even have to sacrifice yourself that uh, others may live. And he makes that point very clear with Frodo and the Shire. It's lost to him that others may have it. I have no doubt he was thinking of uh, of his own uh, lost friends in the in the first war. Yes, to... and that was one of the things too about Tolkien's past uh, is he basically lost, like you say, all of his friends in the first world war. Like they pretty much all died, and he was one of the only last people from his group who ended up surviving it. So, and I think that also mm -hmm. comes contributes to his. <laughs> hatred of uh mechanization i think uh i was I, I think it was like in a documentary i was watching but he he claimed that the internal combustion engine was one of the most evil things ever invented <laughs> mm. and uh yeah and you you could understand based off his own sort of personal experience why he would have these sorts of takes these this sort of um hatred of I guess kind of mechanization, industrialization to a certain extent, and also the incompetence of power, which sort of led to the catastrophe that claimed all of his friends' lives when he was younger. Yeah. 
I think, I mean, I, I'll push back a little bit on the on the stereotype of the, the Blackadder stereotype. Uh, I'm not going to criticise you, Mr. Patriarch, and assuming that's entirely what you meant, nor do I really want to get into an involved uh, conversation about this. Um, but obviously, these two topics are linked, the, the mechanisation of society, uh, the corruption of the natural environment, uh, desecration, turning the world into a desert. It just so happens that Isengard and Mordor uh, which are the most warlike places in all of middle earth are also the most destitute uh, they're the most barren they are the most um uh, they're they're essentially wastelands and of course when the the fellowship the last alliance what have you uh when they are acting they are always acting in some form of defense they're not acting as aggressors they're not acting as conquerors so even here as you mentioned, Charles, this is a feint. This is not an attempt to um, to conquer Mordor. Uh, this is an attempt to try and give um, uh, the company the last chance to destroy the ring. And um, this is very clear. You know, it's Sauron has um, laid down the gauntlet as Saruman um, gives essentially the same casus belli um, against the kingdom of Rohan, and as is the case with Melkor. And uh, I think this is obviously you're you're just in your conflict i think why the shire the scaring of the shire is interesting is that it isn't necessarily a um a, as clear cut as this and i think the scaring of the shire and what we discussed earlier nathan is quite interesting in terms of illuminating tolkien's mindset because of course frodo who is very pensive very conscious about the um uh, potential loss of life and the idea that there hasn't been a civil war between hobbits um, is very anxious not to engage in any action which will result in a loss of life, not even necessarily of the ruffians. And of course, he is consistently bestowing mercy upon Saruman, even after Saruman tries to kill him. And I think this is uh, an essential point to understand about um, Tolkien. He is not a pacifist in the no. sense, no, not by any means. However, he is a great advocate of a mercy and I think a Christian conception of mercy and this idea that even a figure such as Saruman, uh, who we discussed in that stream has you know, utterly degenerated, um, represents some form of nobility, even though it's corrupted. And um, he is deserving of respect and mercy as that entity. And of course, this is something that would extend to all creatures, um, all creations of Eru, Eru Luvatar. It's interesting that uh, in a certain sense, Grima Wormtongue plays there the role that Gollum plays at the end of um, Lord of the Rings, at the end of the quest, because no one is going to hurt Saruman. None of the good people will. And yet Saruman does have to be removed. So who is used but the terrible Grima Wormtongue? Uh, again, he gets Saruman out of the way without benefiting himself. And this again is a, an act of mercy which allows this, just as Gollum, uh, Frodo's mercy towards Gollum allows the completion of the destruction of the ring. So in the book, it's Theoden who shows mercy to Wormtongue, gives yeah. him the opportunity to go where he will, and this allows for the destruction of Saruman. I, th I think this touches on a, an important point we can uh, bring back to Schmidt, is this idea that you can show mercy to people providing at the point where they're no longer an existential threat. So mm. there's no thought of um, saying to Sauron, oh, we'll have mercy on Sauron at some point, because he's always going to want to dominate Middle Earth until he's utterly defeated in this. Same with the Black Gate. Then they're, they're they're fighting because the orcs still pose an existential threat to them. But as soon as somebody like Wormtongue is no longer has power over Theoden, there's an opportunity to show mercy towards him. Right. Same even with Saruman when he, he attempts to kill Frodo, but he fails and he's left impotent. So Frodo can show him that mercy. So there's I think that's a really helpful way of thinking about it, existential threat. The problem we have in the US is that uh, they paint everyone as Sauron, and so no one is worthy of mercy, and they all have to be crushed. <laughs> but anyway, 
<laughs> or they or they or they do the opposite they try and rehabilitate S uh, sauron and they try and rehabilitate the orcs we have to come to an understanding with the orcs uh, we don't see the orcs as some form of existential threat um orc lives matter etc etc um, orc lives matter a great deal and i think we i think we have to bear in mind that orcs have been through a great deal of unpleasantry in their upbringing right they misunderstood right. And I think we need to create an environment where orcs can feel welcome and included. Their public schools didn't get enough money. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so, are we going to be able to do the environmental stuff? Because I have yes. A this is this is the last that. the last point which I want to go to. Obviously, we've illustrated a bit about the the industrial complex with war, especially how it pertained to um, uh, Tolkien's experience, the Battle of the Somme. So the last point I want to bring up, I mean, obviously, I, I, I can't help but notice that uh, Tolkien in many ways is a bit of a, um, a forerunner to, um, to Uncle Ted. Uh, but yes, certainly, um, uh, unleash your perspective on um, environmentalism here. Right well, now. just just a personal note. I mean, I, I read Tolkien when I was young, the first time. And um, he's had an influence on so so many in so many ways he went under the mind right so i couldn't even tell you all the ways in which tolkien influenced me but as i think back on it i, I realized that this is an area where he influenced me where i was um just the the time i was growing up in and being in a sort of a right wing home you know um i i viewed environmentalism as a sort of a creature of the left because we'd already were in that stage, right? Of what do they call them? Watermelon, right? Green on the outside, red on the inside, that sort of thing. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and, and so I just, because of that, I had a really, I'm talking about when I was really young, but I had just sort of a partisan view about this sort of thing. You know, it's like, well, I don't like those people. They're into environmentalism. So I just, you know, poo poo concerns about the environment or whatever. Right. Um, Tolkien helped to bring me out of that and bring me to the place where I try to be on everything at this point, which is to recognize that because something is perverted, doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right? Yes. And Tolkien paints a vision for us of uh, a healthy, a based, you might say, love for nature. Um, mm. And 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 not in so much of a, I, I don't know, maybe, I don't think he wrote like an environmentalist tract or anything, right? But, but just, um, I'm even thinking of his uh, short story, uh, Leaf by Niggle, I think, uh, just the, the att his attention to the details of nature, his loving attention, mm -hmm. I, I think calls to something in us that is deep. I think of one of my favorite children's songs about the environment, Bob Dylan, nobody expects this, right? Bob Dylan's song, Man Gave Names to All the Animals, in which in a very simple a uh, pleasant, whimsical way, he establishes the proper, or he tries to remind us of our proper relationship, right? That there is, there is indeed, man is given a sort of an authority over nature, right? But it is also a stewardship. Um, and that I, that is the vision that Tolkien gave me. It's, <laughs> it's interesting to, to bear in mind that for reasons that I suppose could be explained, but, uh, the questions of conservation of nature and that kind of thing, which we in the United States traditionally thought of as the left-wing interests. In Europe, we're more associated with the right. That's interesting. Hmm. Until, very that, recently, until, uh, well, until, until, until very recently. Well, until very recently, but in Tolkien's day, you had things like the Soil Association and all that uh, in England and some of the things across Europe that were really, really uh, right-wing uh, oriented. Um, and conservation of nature and the natural resources was very much like preservation, historical preservation of, of the built mm. environment. These were seen mm. not as opponents, but as tied together. The, the most recent figure like that you would see in the, on the American scene, I would have to say, would be Teddy Roosevelt. Who, uh, yeah, that's true. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. There's a bit of delay. I'm I'm in Africa, so. <laughs> ah, oh, all right. Go ahead. But uh, I was just going to say that also one last point. I think a um, an, a useful distinction might be made uh, between environmentalism on the one hand, which is the idea that nature is an end in itself. People are human beings are intruders. You know, we've got the carbon imprint, whatever you want to call it. 
That's environmentalism on the one side. The other is conservationism. The idea of stewardship of our natural resources, of, of uh, the land, of its animals, and so on and so forth, mm. as uh, part and parcel of what it is to be uh, stewards of God's creation. Conservationism versus environmentalism. Yes. Yes. No, <laughs> I'm reminded of the, uh, wasn't there a whole thing about the, po the pony being abused? Uh, yeah. Remember? Um, yeah, poor Bill's pony, uh, nasty yeah. Bill's poor pony. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's yeah. really, a, it's really heart wrenching, actually. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, and then they just, and then they just give him tons of apples, and then it becomes plump Bill the pony, and then lives the rest of his days in Rivendell. <laughs> um, <laughs> lucky Bill. But no, that's a very interesting point you bring up, Charles. Is the idea of conservationism versus environmentalism? So, uh, when you look at Europe, you know, the previous century, essentially. Yeah, you had the the conservationist, the sort of environmental conscious were tended to be sort of the more sort of conservative minded Tolkien types, right? The, they yeah. they loved the country, they sort of wanted to preserve it the way it is. And the communists were the ones, I mean, communists were like literally gay for coal plants and steel mills, no, <laughs> essentially. No, no, it's, it's very, very true. Uh, they were big on heavy industry. And mm. as Marx himself, remember, held that the peasants were the most recidivist of the population, uh, which right. is touched on in, in uh, that hideous strength. Uh, when, uh, you know, that little village, I forget what it's called, uh, near Belbury and they go to see it. That's terrible. You know, the rent, small rentier and all that stuff. Uh, and, and bear in mind too, that most of the great, uh, parks in Europe, the great, uh, game preserves started out as Royal hunting forests. Hmm. That's, yes, you know. No, but now what we're seeing, like currently though, what we're seeing is sort of an inversion of that. So capitalizing on the natural, healthy impulse of people to sort of preserve their natural surroundings as a sort of, um, you know, without getting too uh, controversial here on YouTube, a sort of Malthusian attempt <laughs> to sort of depopulate and seize power. So. It's uh, it's taking it's the classic um, leftist impulse to take uh, essentially healthy desires and then use them for nefarious ends. See, uh, I would like... even suggest it's it's not um, it's not the same desire actually, because when you listen to a lot of the propaganda, it's very much we need to save the planet to save the human race. If this happens, we'll be wiped out, or yeah, so... more specifically. Mm. marginalized communities will be yes. oppressed through this through yes. climate change and so on so yes it's, the, it's... the obvious narrative mm. is of course the um a first world created problem affecting the third world and of course this is i mean i i, I essentially argue that this is a form of secular eschatology it's um in the absence in the absence of christianity the um the horrific secular um, malthusian mindset has brought up this idea about the end the ending of the world and as you say um uh, uh nathan it is apocalyptic in scope and they're trying to play on those fears which um uh, mm -hmm. were, were better invested in christianity but they were but, I, but by I, that I liked i like the phrase racism and sexism cause climate change I liked that mm. a lot when I saw it. And, and and by the logic as well, it would imply that if it's about saving humanity or restoring equality, well, then if it was to the benefit of humanity to destroy the environment, we should do that. So it's not really about a love for, for nature in any meaningful sense as an end in itself. It's a means yes. to securing our future, which I think... Yes, it's, it's an extreme form of humanitarianism, problems. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, as opposed to yeah. a, a yeah. love for creation. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, th I think um, unless uh, I think this is probably the time where we get to um, I, I mean, there's probably one last point, uh, which is uh, slightly closer to home regarding the you mentioned, um, uh, Charles, about the 
inherently um, uh, conservationist, uh, conservative aspects of some form of environmentalism. But of course, you know, in addition to the preservation of um, uh, landscapes, there is, of course, the preservation of old estates and buildings. Of course, in England, we have the National Trust. And of course, that institution has decided to um, make its primary function now the um, <laughs> the telling of how the, the owners of various homes, who of course donated their properties to the National Trust, were in some way connected to slavery, or in other way some some irredeemable form of um, bigotry <laughs> uh, you know all I can tell you is that until you get a prime minister who is willing to throw the leadership of those bodies out of office it won't stop <laughs> anyway I think um, th this is the time for closing remarks really so um, I'll, I'll go around the panel and ask for um, you know any sort of points in summation or any further points you want to proffer before we get onto the super chats so first of all um, Radlib well, um, just remind everyone that uh, Tolkien, uh, he said uh, he, he respectfully uh, dislikes um, allegories, right? And so he said, uh, you know, the Lord of the Rings is not meant to be like a retelling of World War II. For one thing, he wrote a lot of it before World War II, but um, it's not meant to be a retelling of World War II. Uh, you know, in, in essence, uh, you know, be cautious about trying to draw too straight of a line from elements in the Lord of the Rings to things in the real world. Having said that, <laughs> um, there, there, it, it still seems like to me, Tolkien uh, has rich insight in so many ways, in particular, the subject of the stream, uh, political life, <clears throat> but he has a more uh, poetic way of coming at it, right? Um, he didn't leave us with treatises or manifestos. As I said, he, he left us with a um, emotional attachment to this imaginary place called the Shire, right? Mm. And he left us with a terror for uh, men who seek power and become empty shells of what they once were, become wraiths, right? Um, and th that, to me, in many ways, I think it probably will serve us better yes. than I if think he left the... us with a manifesto. I think this is the fundamental strength you bring up of Tolkien, as opposed to um, many of the political writers that we discuss in our circles, which is that Tolkien has mass appeal. And that these, even if these um, points that we're raising here can't necessarily be articulated, I think there is some sort of implicit understanding or inference that people can gather from watching this. And I think this is why, regrettably, there is such an impetus on subverting Tolkien and trying yeah, to right. warp this philosophy into something that it isn't, because there is a recognition that this mass appeal is fundamentally dangerous. Right, but as I pointed out, right, I am, uh, we, we have not obsessed over that uh, subversion of Tolkien today. We have stepped Absolutely. over it, we have stepped over Absolutely. it, and we have just focused on his great work and uh, sat at the feet of Tolkien, and that's the right way to do it. Absolutely. Thank you for, for, for putting me back in my um, my place, Radlib. Um, Charles, anything you want to, um, uh, 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 any points you want to make in summation? Well, yes, uh, I would say that precisely because he was such a believer and because he believed in a divine order that in itself brings freedom, he was a real humanist. He really loved mankind in all its messy, different varieties. Uh, and this, in this he had a lot in common with Lewis and with Charles Williams, the other two other foremost inklings. Be, it was because of that, you know, you look at their works, you say, what is it that's so inviting about them? Well, one could, go, one could come up with, so, with many, many reasons as to the power of the works, but what pulls you in, at the end of the day, is their geniality. I mean, if you think of how we were first introduced to the hobbits, it was a hobbit hole and that means comfort. Mm -hmm. Or you, you, you think of, uh, you think of uh, Lewis and Williams as well. Their stories are genial. They love mankind because they love God. Because they love, and because they love mankind, they're also able to love the environment, etc. They love the creator, they love his creatures. And without, I think, that love of the creator, 
you can't really love his creatures and you can't really be genial. Hmm. There'll be an edge, a hardness, which you see in so much of modern literature today, let alone modern politics and governance and media and academia and etc. ad nauseam. Nathan. Two connected points. Uh, one just really building on what Charles has said, that Tolkien's world is one that celebrates life in it, all its fullness, and evil is a reduction of facets of our being. And you can see this in the characters of Ringwraiths who are literally becoming nothingness. And tying into what Radlib said, when we look at Tolkien or Lewis or George MacDonald or somebody like Thomas Carlyle even, what we see in that, that their writing is about changing their reader. It's not just about information uh, stored in your head. It's supposed to evoke something in you quite deep that each person will articulate in different ways according to their own gifts and their own experiences. But just as Mary blows the horn of Rohan and rouses the Shire against the, the ruffians and Sharky's tyranny, so too the Lord of the Rings is supposed to stir something within us and help us to discern what's right and wrong so that we can address it in our own context as best we can. Thank you. Wonderfully said, Nathan. Mr. Patriarch. Yes. Um, as Radlib had sort of mentioned, there's a lot of talk about <clears throat> Tolkien's work being considered an allegory. And I don't, th I, he's, he's, Tolkien himself mentioned that this was not the case, but the magic of his work is that sort of the aesthetic that he creates sort of sells his vision without being a, you know, a political tract. It's not explicitly allegorical, but it's tapping into eternal truths about mankind, about spirituality, about uh, peoplehood. And thus it's kind of impossible not to see the real world sort of reflected to some degree in his work. So one of the things I mentioned in my video was that um, great myths are always rooted in what has come before. And it's, and the, the, the beauty about Tolkien is that it manages to be truthful without being strictly real. It's, um, it's a timeless piece of fiction for a reason. And I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that although, you know, maybe the Marvel MCU will fade and <laughs> Star Wars <laughs> will fade, uh, Tolkien will persist into the future. And, um, I'm very happy to have been part of this project that you put together and to propagate and simp for Tolkien on this Tolkien day. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Page. I could just emphasize your point. I mean, um, this channel is um, mainly dedicated to history and I can't help, but as you know, a historian of, you know, a very limited ability, look at the works of Tolkien and constantly I am in awe and astonished by how much, again, hate to use the word allegory, but I will use it here, how much I can read into Tolkien, which isn't directly there all the time. And every time I reread re -read one of his works, I'm always left with a slightly new appreciation, uh, which I didn't quite have before. And I think this is the remarkable thing about Tolkien. I can't remember, Charles, if you mentioned this on stream or before, but it's the idea that you can never really truly get all of Tolkien. Um, the study of Tolkien is, ongoing, not just because um, uh, new materials by him are continually being published, but the idea that the work itself is um, so rich in scope and so all-encompassing um, that one can pursue an entire lifetime dedicated to it and one can still learn more about him. And that is why, you know, uh, Tolkien is such a great figure. And um, as Tom Shippey said, the order of the century, I think that is a um, an accolade which is um, can be rightfully bestowed upon Tolkien. So. Without further ado, um, we can get on to the Super Chats. Um, there are quite a few. So uh, Jimmy Thomas for five Canadian dollars doesn't say anything. So um, thank you, Jimmy Thomas, for that. Uh, Pelham Whitestrake for eight pounds and 99 pence. Arise, arise, riders of Theoden. Spear shall be shaken. Shields shall be splintered. A sword day, a red day, ere the sun rises. Ride now, ride, ride to ruin and the world's ending. Well, uh, thank you for making me say that, um, Pelena Whitestrake. Um, uh, Winter Phoenix Forest Kirin for three US dollars. 
uh, $3 for the helpers under Neon Stars. Well, thank you very much. And there are a series of um, uh, super chats by uh, Winter Phoenix Forest Kirin. The second one uh, for $7. Uh, send dollars for the Columba Kings in their Highland Thrones. <laughs> and of course, that is an allusion <laughs> to um, <laughs> um, Polish ambassador is um, saying I could have given that line more emotion. <laughs> I, th I thought I gave it a reasonable amount of emotion. You should um, uh, read my reading of the um, the scouring of the Shire earlier. I do also have to say that I am coming off a, um, a rather bad cold and a sore throat. So um, apologies if I can't be as um, dramatic as I as I possibly could be um, uh, in full health. Um, but of course, that um, super chat is an allusion to my um, my erstwhile um, collaborator on this channel, um, Columbus. So thank you for that. And nine dollars for the trucks in chat who deserve to die, <laughs> myself included. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one more dollar for AM in his dark YouTube halls <laughs> in the land of Susan where the shadows lie. Yes, um, we, are, we are all dwelling in the, um, in the, the hallowed halls of Wujiki. <laughs> and and, um, true. and we, live, we, li we live and die <laughs> by, by, uh, by that sword of Damocles. <laughs> um, RCW for um, five pounds, thank you very much. Um, Thanks for a great talking day. Well, thank you, RCW. Thank you very much. Um, Anu Ra for five pounds says, uh, the scouring of the Shire reminds me of the evil that are estate agents. <laughs> okay. Um, the Prudentialist for um, $2. Uh, well done by all who made um, something great today. Well, th thank you, Prudentialist. And um, thanks, obviously, and extended to um, all the guests here and to all of the contributors who aren't on the stream but have been invaluable to um, Talking Day, so thank you very much. Um, Sam, 153, uh, for 15 Canadian dollars, thank you very much. Um, another appreciation for Talking Day, thank you very much. John Boy for 20 pounds, thank you very much, John Boy. Uh, thanks to AM, Nathan and all for Talking Day, well, thank you very much. Um, Anu Ra for five pounds. I remember reading a few years ago, uh, comparing the Numenorians to the ancient Egyptians. Um, how accurate do you think this comparison is? And I think I'll give that one to the panel. Uh, uh, I I see them mm. more as Roman, but that's just me. Mm. Yeah, I don't I don't really see them as uh, Egyptians. I don't I don't make the link there. I mean, you could make allusions to Atlantis. You know, a great civilization. Yes, in the sea, yeah. sort of destroyed in a cataclysm. But um, uh, Egypt, no, I don't see it. Yes, but even then, I mean, if you're referring to Atlantean civilization, which is um, alluded to in Plato, but it is mythical, um, you know, the, the closest thing you can sort of draw to it, if Tolkien is actually trying to go for a literal interpretation, some civilization beyond the pillars of Hercules, um, I, I can't really see that in the Numenorians. I mean, I'm trying maybe to apply um, some aspects of Egyptian mythology um, to the Numenorians. I mean, certainly in their, their language is Semitic, and I think there is some uh, comparison you can draw to you know, Arabic aesthetics, um, but definitely not in the religion and their ethos. Um, but there's also elements of um, uh, the Kingdom of Israel which one can draw, and of course, an illusion which we haven't drawn, of course, is the uh, comparison between um, uh, Aragon and um, King David, which I think um, is a fair comparison. Please, please correct me if I'm wrong. But in terms of the Egyptians, if you were to, um, uh, if there were a Jewish connection, if there were a, um, a Kingdom of Israel connection to Numenor, and if the Numenorians were in some way a facsimile of um, Christian civilization, um, uh, the Kingdom of Israel and um, Roman civilization. Uh, I think having some sort of explicit connection to the Egyptians is rather strange, to say the least, especially considering the story of Exodus. They may, though, have a connection to the Babylonians, or the, the city of Babylon in particular, if you think of the yes, fall of yes, Numenor and absolutely, um, yeah. God's judgment on Babylon throughout the Bible. So that might be an yes. illusion to draw. Yes, absolutely. So um, Mesopotamian, if not um, Egyptian influence, and in Ra. Um, anyone else have anything to say on that? No? Okay. Um, Lady of Shalott for £4.49. and pence. What would Tolkien think of the state of Britain now? And what would his vice be on how to prevail? 
huge thanks for the wonderful content today. And that's um, the eternal question, really. So again, to the panel. I'll defer first to, to our resident Englishman, Nathan. Where do you even begin with this question? I, I think it's, I think uh, first and foremost, the something we've kind of been alluding to throughout is doing the right thing, regardless of, that, that might be difficult to determine always, but there's a, there's a sense of don't compromise and do what's right. I think that's key to what Tolkien believed in. Um, and you see this in the scouring of the Shire where Merry and Pippin, who are two characters who have had to break the rules um, in the past with Theoden and Denethor to do the right thing, then in the Shire are willing to oppose the tyrannous, the tyrannical situation. So I, I would suggest something like that um, would be a good starting point. And then also hope, because in the world of Middle Earth, we've alluded to that there's another power at work besides evil. And as Gandalf um, says, we don't know all ends of all things at this point. So even though things look rather bleak and dark, there is cause for hope because we don't live in a world, a, a, a material world that only a material world. There is another power and it is going to act someday. Yeah, I'll, I'll just share uh, along those lines. I'll share the last uh, few sentences from the article I read for today's for Tolkien Day today. Um, no matter how dark it gets, don't give up hope. Stay true. Have courage. Help may come from unexpected places. And I would add to that myself that uh, he, if you look at, at his life, and uh, re remember that, that Britain was, in his day, after the war, Britain was going in directions he did not like at all. And just to elucidate By, on that, uh, 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 sorry, we you cut out there a second, Charles. Yeah, he, he was going in, direct, in directions uh, he didn't like at all. Continue from there. Britain, Britain was going in directions he didn't like at all. He was very much against the nationalizations under Attlee. He uh, was extremely unhappy with the way the empire was dismantled. Uh, he was not an imperialist. An interesting thing about Tolkien. Uh, he was a little Englander in a lot of ways, like Chester mm -hmm. or Bellic. But he did believe that the way the empire was being dismantled would do neither Britain nor the colonies any good. And, mm -hmm. of course, he, he was completely right. I mean, it, it, everything he feared came to pass. But in the midst of all that, what did he do? Well, he didn't, do, he didn't run for uh, – he, he didn't stand for office. What he did do was, A, he redoubled his faith mm. when the mass changed, which he was very much against. Mm. He, he took it as a penance and applied it, as it were, in that, in that manner. He um, tried to make the area that he was in as best he could. And so one of the things that's really struck me over the past couple of years is how little prior to that time how little attention was given by so many of us to our local governance. To uh, we were so fixed on the national, or the or the state or provincial or larger focus, that we didn't really look very closely at what was going on in our own towns, our own neighborhoods. Uh, so perhaps one of the things you would do if you were alive today is spend a lot more time on conservation, preservation uh, of the local land, wherever it is you find yourself. Hmm. Um, it's, remember one thing that definitely comes out of Tolkien is a love of place. Whatever your place is, whether it's a, uh, a part of a city or it's out in the countryside somewhere, uh, try to try to love the area you're in, try to get to know it. I mean, how, how many of us live in, in towns or suburbs? We don't, we don't know them, really. We might park our bodies there after we get back from work, but that's about it. Mm. So uh, I think that re reclaiming within ourselves a love of the local, an interest in the local, an intervention in the local, 
would be a wise move that he would endorse. Absolutely, and I would uh, completely concur with your sentiments there, Charles. Um, especially the noticing, you know, seemingly contradiction about um, the idea of preservation of the of the empire, whether that be, you know, the um, the idea of the Catholic Empire in the First World War, the British Empire in the Second World War, and its aftermath. Um, and of course, I can empathise as having that. I think we've discussed this, Radlib, this idea of um, universalism and particularism and subsidiarity, which seem to be you know, contradictory on the surface. But if you're steeped in you know, medieval or Catholic understanding, it makes a lot more sense. Um, Mr. Patriarch, is there anything um, you would like to say? Well, I guess I'd have to agree with sort of all that everyone said. But <clears throat> the one contribution I will make is that um, as bad as he would find the modern situation, I think he would not sort of see it hopeless in necessarily the long run. I mean, if we look at his fiction, we have, you know, the destruction of the kingdom of Arnor and all these places which are degraded, the king's gone, the house of the stewards is sort of holding on to mm. uh, a, a faltering empire. I'm sorry, a, a faltering kingdom of Gondor. Uh, the outsiders are pushing in. There's a degradation interiorly. Um, and the kingdom's just tired. It's just tired of, <laughs> it's like Douglas mm. Murray. You know? <laughs> Europe is tired. I mean, Gondor is tired, you know. Um, mm. uh, and if we also look at history, we see many situations of falls of, you know, empires and kingdoms and foreign occupations and whatnot. But <clears throat> very often times, they don't last forever, even if it does last for a long time. You know, the mm. Babylonian captivity was like, what, 400 years <laughs> or and, uh, you know, the same thing with um, in the fiction of Lord of the Rings. You know, the king was gone. The kingdom of uh, Arnor, you know, died hundreds of years ago. And yet hope springs eternal. Right. Mm. So even though we are sort of have our backs up against the wall in a certain sense. And we're facing this, you know, global homo techno uh, technocracy sort of being imposed upon us. Um, I am confident that in the long run, that which can't work won't work. And hopefully from the ashes, uh, you know, a, a light from the, what, what was that? Uh, a light from the oh. shadows shall spring. Renewed will be blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. So. Mm. <laughs> and, and he, uh, you know, uh, at the very least, there was the star shining over the muck and rack in Mordor. A beauty that the shadow could never touch. Mm. That's, that's something we all have to remember when we tend to get a bit depressed or brought down. That the beautiful, the true, and the good will always outlast every attempt to destroy it. And that's something Tolkien knew. Yep. Wonderful. Yeah, that was that was uh, mentioned uh, in the, I think it was in the Return of the King. You know, they see a star and he's like, above all this filth and Mordor and whatnot, there's beauty imperishable which, they, which cannot be marred and they can't conquer forever. That's exactly right, Charles. Wonderful. Can I just um, add a very quick point, A.M.? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, because uh, I, th I think it will, uh, he Tolkien would tell us also to read good mythology and mm. good fantasy, because it's through these stories that, like the hobbits learning to know right from wrong and having the courage to do so, we as readers also learn that through reading these stories. And so we'll be better at spotting that star in the sky in Mordor if we immerse ourselves in this wonderful and rich cultural traditions that we have. Yeah. Absolutely, and um, absolutely wonderful and wonderful contributions. Just one uh, final point I'll make, um, not, not a point I'll make, but rather I would suggest that people watch the preceding stream hosted by Lambda, uh, talking very much about this aspect of Tolkien, hope contrasted with despair, and how we can construe Tolkien through a Christian lens. So please, everyone, go and watch the um, preceding stream. Moving on to Polish ambassador, my 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 erstwhile nemesis um, for 25 Slotty. I've come to believe that prophecies in secular age tend to laugh as popular books for PR reasons. Um, New World Order, 1984. I await return of the king. 
Mm, I mean, there is a lot that can be gleaned from 1984 and the New World Order. Um, I wouldn't necessarily just completely write them off. I mean, I do think there's a value to um, George Orwell and Aldous Huxley. Um, you know, I think. Oh, I, the... I don't think I don't think that the super chatter was writing them off. He was just saying that um, rather than being presented as a prophecy, they're presented. We still have prophecies. They're just presented in the guise of. Ah, oh, yes. Lord yes, of the Rings, meant... and, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, apologies if I um I, I saw Polish ambassador a little short there. Um, <laughs> thank you for that, Radlib. Um, <laughs> John Gordon for um uh, nine ninety nine US dollars. Thank you very much. Um, AM announces talking day after two week break. Me look like streams are back on the menu, boys. <laughs> One of the most infamous um, bits of dialogue from um, <laughs> the Twin Towers. Uh, th thank you for inflicting that on us, John Gordon. Um, Polish ambassador for Ten Zloty. Um, Urukai weren't born but made. Um, they were robots. Well, uh, they weren't robots, but that's a thing which needs to be emphasized about the um, various creations, you know, whether it be the the creations of Morgoth, the you know, the primordial evil that, for example, that encapsulates the Balrog or the Orcs or the Urukai. I think there is um a fundamental aspect in Tolkien when trying to construe, you know, a conflict against them, that they are almost um, inherently an existential threat, um, you know, set aside from any sort of um, petty distinction. I mean, orcs um, alone, without the sort of um, organization of um, Sauron, um, are, you know, a hazard everywhere, you know, so are other, other great creatures such as trolls. I mean, the perversion of these creatures is so great that they are, in fact, hurt by sunlight. They are essentially abomination to this idea of creation. And um, I think this is something that needs to be understood before we go on the um, Orc Lives Matter tirade. <laughs> I, I just, I, I raise my voice once again for the poor, uh, disenfranchised orcs and the orc wives who are never spoken about. <laughs> there is an interesting, um, I remember reading an interesting article about whether orcs have souls or not. Mm. And um, th this is a, an important question because you could interpret the Urukai and the trolls in particular. Well, they're imitations. They don't. They they live, but they don't have a soul that will progress mm. to the afterlife. But this article is suggesting if they did have souls, then there's a lot of um, mystery about the afterlife, particularly for the state of men. Yes, it's not clear what's going to, to the elves what will happen to men in the afterlife, and so whether or not there is the potentiality even for orcs to have some form of redemption in the afterlife they were suggesting. Mm. I think it was off one quotation they were building this big argument. <laughs> I I don't know how far I, I, I could really go with that. I I mean, the, the whole point of the orcs and of the trolls and uh, the orc high is that they are irredeemable. They're just nasty, awful things. And see, the other problem is that if they have souls, eternal souls, you go into the problem of free will for orcs. You're yes, saying. and I, th I think that's a fundamental element which needs to be addressed here. I think they are, I mean, you know, we talk about the original discord brought by Melkor. I think they are purely elements of discord. I mean, you can talk about this simplified notion of a somewhat sentient creature, but it's even arguable whether they are sentient, whether they do, as you as you mentioned, Charles, have this capacity for free will, free agency. If that is the case, it, it doesn't matter almost debating it because it's not exhibited in any way throughout any of Tolkien's writing. There isn't the story of the, the orc who defected. Yeah, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, is, that simply isn't the case. Uh, Bobby, I think for, Bobby the friendly orc. <laughs> <laughs> and I think for that simple fact alone, um, it doesn't really work discussion because if Tolkien wanted this point to be addressed then he himself would have um, uh, given more uh, more meat on that argument but of course and, that simply is an extrapolation and it hasn't you know it's a funny thing I don't believe that there's any real writing of his extant uh, published or unpublished of all the many many volumes that have come out since the Silmarillion I don't think any any of them does he go into any detail about the orcs or the trolls in terms of their, for want of a better word, interior life, their anthropology, mm. if you will. He really doesn't. He he goes into all sorts of other seeming minutiae, but he doesn't deal with them. 
Absolutely. And this is probably one of the sort of great questions. I mean, I remember thinking this when I was a child reading Lord of the Rings for the first time. I wanted to know what the orcs did in their in their free time um, behind the gates of Barador. I wanted to try and understand the, uh, the orc mindset. But then, of course, you, you understand in the sense that the um, the orcs, uh, I mean, they're not just a plot device that that's to demean Tolkien, uh, but they are a corruption. I think they encapsulate this idea that um, uh, this is an imitation of of life this isn't a true representation of life this isn't a form mm. of life um, that can reproduce that can create it's only a form of life that can destroy it is a perversion of creation and i think that is what we have to be we have to bear in mind when reading about the orcs right um the n reap for 20 pounds uh thank you for this amazing day am nathan radlib colombo patriarch and everyone else uh looking forward to a future day to explore numenor uh the fall of gondolin uh, dwarven history and many other topics well this is probably um good a time as any i was going to leave this the, to the end uh, but i do have a slight hidden agenda uh, with regards to Tolkien Day. Um, in addition to celebrating the man and trying to approach him from many aspects, I, I will admit probably the, the one aspect I really wish we would cover is Tolkien as a philologist, um, really understanding his process of creating languages and his history with the Germanic languages and e even a classicist because he was familiar, of course, with Latin. Um, sadly, we don't have that. Maybe we can have that at a, a future time. Um, but one element, of course, is a deep dive into the real history of um, Middle Earth. And um, Mr. Patriarch and Nathan Hood, I've discussed this with you about the idea of trying to turn this into a, um, a law series, essentially, uh, beginning with creation, carrying this through the various ages mm. of Middle Earth. And um, I really do intend, after Tolkien Day, of making that happen and trying to um, produce a series in the form of the main series on this channel, uh, which focuses on mainly history, but trying to tackle Tolkien in total in that way, drawing upon the stories, but also drawing on the um, development of the world as a whole. So, um, I, I just in regards to Tolkien as a philologist, I, I, I believe I read that he would have conversations with, I, I think, grad students in Old English, which I just think mm. is amazing. <laughs> well, he used to um, he used to begin his Beowulf lecture, um, uh, but, but by speaking and um, uh, but by you know, dramatizing it at the same time. So, you know, I, I think this is a wonderful aspect to him. But you know, I really wanted maybe to um, have an investigation of Elvish. I mean, uh, you know, also not just um, you know looking at Sindarin and Quenya, uh, looking at their phonetic qualities, um, what Tolkien value, looking at um, a secret vice and all that. Um, but I also wanted to go into his created alphabets, in particular Tengvar. Um, I wanted to look into the idea of black speech and him trying to create a hideous language. Um, all of these things, and of course, you know, a, a large part of philology is trying to um, retroactively reconstruct words which you imagine people said um, in, a, in a long distant future. This, of course, is all fascinating, but um, it's something we'll have to leave for another time. And um, I, I do confess my my limit my limitations in this regard i'm not a natural linguist by any means i'm an enthusiast but i'm in no way um uh, competent in this sphere uh nico for 10 pounds thank you very much uh great fiction should be a mirror to reality uh you guys have helped polish it a little for us a great year of content thank you am well thank you very much nico um I i'm not going to be able to pronounce this name but i'll try um, Hussein Badakchani for five pounds. If Tolkien came across Bitcoin, uh, would he consider it to be a ring or something more akin to a mithril shirt? We all wish we we all wish we knew the answer to that question. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <Not me>. Mo <laughs> Momo Kio for five euros. Um, thank you, AM, and everyone who contributed to Tolkien Day. Uh, you have all made my day at work much more bearable. Well, <laughs> that's um, that's that's the ultimate achievement. If we can um, uh, take people out of their misery, then um, it was all worth it in the end. So thank you, um, Mama Kio. Vingle, um, I'm not actually familiar with that um, currency. Is that krona, 50 krona? Um, Tolkien mm. on his childhood village, Serhol, um, behind all the Hobbit stuff, lay a sense of insecurity. I always knew it would go away, and it did. Um, Nathan, is there anything you want to elaborate that? Because I, I know you've um, uh, talked significantly about um, uh, his upbringing in Serhal. 
Yeah, and uh, I had the privilege of living quite close to Sir Hall actually as well. And what what strikes you about the place is when Tolkien was growing up, it was all fields around there, meadows. There was mostly bog, which is the inspiration for the old forest, some say, with the dark wood inside. And from a very young age, I think he was about five when he moved there, and he would just spend every day playing in those fields. And later in life, he would say it was the most formative part part of his childhood on his, on his imagination. When he returned in 1933, the whole the whole area had been uh, subsumed into Birmingham. It had all been urbanized. Many of the old sites had just been built houses on. A new petrol station was in place. There was motor cars everywhere. And it was it was particularly painful for Tolkien because that was those were the few years that he got to spend the last few years with his mother. And when she died, they left Sare Hall. So it had it was it wasn't just the degradation of that area, it was also the emotional connection he had with it too. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Nathan. So that's it for the Super Chats. And I think this is the time of the stream where um, I go around the panel and um, ask them to elaborate on um, what they're doing on um, other channels or other various enterprises. Um, so Mr. Patriarch, you first. Yes, well, um, I'm currently in the middle of moving from Africa back to the United States. Um, so I'm pretty busy with that, but I'm going to be trying to create some new um, content on my channel. I still have to finish <laughs> the uh, never ending uh, Machiavelli series. So I'll see if I can't finish, put out another video on that this week or next. So that's kind of my main plan. And um, apart from that, um, the aforementioned, uh, Tolkien lore <laughs> history uh, series with um, Apostolic Majesty. I, depending on sort of what my time zones are going to be after I move, um, I'll see if I can't participate in that as well. So that's what Wonderful. I got planned I'm, I'm, for now. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'll be able to come up with a um, appropriately pretentious name in a couple of weeks, Mr. Patriarch. Um, but yes, for that series. <laughs> um, but um, yes, thank you very much. Um, Nathan. Yeah, so I have, um, I started before Christmas a series uh, called Origins of Equality, and uh, or Origins of Liberty, I forget now. And it was looking at early modern movements, such as the Levelers, the Diggers, the Quakers, and how their ideas kind of burst onto the scene and introduced classical liberalism, proto-communism, and so on. So I'll get back to that at some point, I think as well. This stream in particular has confirmed that there needs to be a stream at some point on that hideous strength. So that would be some, something fun to do at some point. Um, and beyond that, I just want to say a massive thank you uh, to everybody on the panel, everybody who's been involved in Talking Day, and in particular to Apostolic Majesty. He's far too humble to take any credit for it. But without him, the organization of the day, the promotion of it, all of the, the wonderful music that's been involved, all of the guests, it's a lot of it's down to apostolic majesty and he deserves massive credit for it. Well, well thank you, Nathan. Well, while, while well, sick, while well, sick, it should be noted. <laughs> well, <I'll say>. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I just want to emphasize that this has indeed, um, uh, like the Lord of the Rings, this has been a collaborative effort from, um, all sides of the council being able to, um, to bring this project to fruition. But, um, thank you, nevertheless, Nathan. That's, that, that's really much appreciated. Um, Charles, Anything you would like to say? Oh, well, uh, yeah, I'm uh, still slugging away with my producer, Vinny Franchini, every Monday. You can see uh, a new show on the um, Tumblr House YouTube channel of uh, Off the Menu. And uh, we continue to have our, our crazed fun. Um, I'm writing for the European Conservative uh, Crisis. Um, Catholicism.org. Let's see. Am I missing anybody? I think that's everything for the moment. And I'm uh, uh, playing with a couple of new book ideas, which will uh, be revealed in due course. Wonderful. And we'll be, I'll be very interested to see what those books are. Um, and there Me is a too. link. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and there is a link to um to everyone including um tumble house in the description if you want to check that out uh radlib well the, the name of my channel is radical liberation as i mentioned the the subhead says uh economics politics history but i hope by participating in things like tolkien day uh people who might be scared off by some of those words uh will give me a chance um charles you might be interested one of the shows we did was on the um, Industrial Revolution of the Middle Ages, which no one knows about, uh, but we covered it on my channel. Um, Peacework, two words, piecework. Right. Um, so uh, my point is that um, I do try to, with the show, uh, come at things from a different angle. And ideally, like with that Industrial Revolution of the Middle Ages, uh, surprise you with something that you, uh, didn't know about and are enriched by knowing. So uh, please, please join us. Oh, and also I should mention, I, I just posted a little short uh, sort of uh, declaration on January 1st. I, uh, writing was always a big interest of mine and um, it's taken a back seat for a while. I've been doing YouTube, you know, um, but I used to write. I used to write for lourockwell.com and Mises.org and uh, many other things. And, um, I think I'm, I'm ready to get back into it. So you should see some writing from me. And therefore, in addition to my live show every week on politics, economics, history, uh, some shorter pieces on, on maybe a more diverse topics, uh, you know, where I basically read, read the things I've written and, and do that as a video, treat those as scripts. So it uh, should be a good year. Absolutely. And do Excellent. check out um, Radlib's wonderful channel. So in addition to um, thanking all the um, members of the panel for participating in Talking Day, um, really appreciate you all being here. I also want to thank all of the other people who have contributed um, to Talking Day. Um, Skeptical Waves, um, John D., um, Columba, um, my, my usual co-host on this channel, who produced two of his own videos, which um, I publish on this channel. Um, it was the first for him, so I'm very appreciative uh, to him, and I'm very happy with how they turned out. I thought they were wonderful. So thank you again, Columba. Um, thank you again to Nathan Hood for hosting the Scaring of the Shire and for your wonderful um, video on the nature of power in the Lord of the Rings. I want to thank Panama Hat for his episode on the poetry of J.R. Tolkien. It's something which is very much underappreciated, and um, Panama Hat is able to really shine light on the um, the competence, the superlative competence of Tolkien as a poet. Then, of course, there is your video, Radical Liberation, Tolkien versus the Literati, uh, based on your wonderful article. So thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Patriarch, there is, of course, your creation myth of Arda video, which I advise everyone to watch along with all the other videos. It's wonderful, and there was wonderful edited and put together so thank you mr patriarch um there is of course lambda stream um hope and despair and um that was again wonderful to listen to i mean we, we talk about many aspects of talking but in particular the, the christian themes within um lords of the rings i think go to lambda's channel of course he is a bible study um channel primarily so if you want that aspect of talking uh, please do and uh, do go and see that stream um other than that I, I guess I, I must thank um, Academic Agent for um, for shilling the stream, along with um, a whole host of other people who've um, helped promote the stream. I, I thank you very much. Um, other than that, I want to thank the viewers, the, the viewers um, themselves, for watching this video, for watching Talking Day, for participating in Talking Day, for um, providing questions, for helping this, helping make this possible. Um, I also want to thank you know, supporters of the channel, um, people who go over on Subscribestar, um, all that is very much appreciated. Um, if you like any of the Talking Day content, you know, um, including the stream, um, commenting and, you know, liking is very much appreciated. In terms of a, um, a final ending um, for this episode, um, in addition to many of the contributions, oh, there is um, one super chat, which I've which is actually appropriate as a lead on, uh, which is by um, uh, Connor Maxwell, CM Piano 2. Uh, thank you very much for today. Well, of course, um, he has helped uh, contribute to the piano music, the piano performances, which you've heard invariably. Um, I've excerpts or the whole performance in the form of the um, schedule video. So thank you very much for him. Uh, but there was a, another contribution by an, another one of my Twitter followers, uh, Snowfarer, 
who I've linked in the description, who submitted to me an original Tolkien-esque uh, composition, a lullaby, uh, which I thought very appropriate to um, to finish Talking Day. Uh, forgive me if this doesn't work, but I'm, I'm going to leave us off uh, listening to that piece of music. Um, it's only about uh, two minutes, but I really want everyone to appreciate um, all of the different contributions and especially the musical contributions to Talking Day. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you to my wonderful um, guests on the stream and good night. Thank you.